Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to this uh, afternoon session. Uh, my name is Manuela Tiramani. I'm the head of the Pesticide Peer Review Unit in EPSA. And uh, um, today we want to start uh, with a discussion uh, that actually started some years ago, not yet over, eh? and this is the reason why we are here again to, to um, um, exchange views on this very sensitive and interesting topic, endocrine disruption. So I think with the help of the speakers, the colleagues who contributed to the session uh, preparation, we want to uh, check what the current status is in terms of uh, regulatory requirements, uh, scientific knowledge, but also, and this is very timely, because of the session of this morning on uh, NAMS, also trying to see where NAMS can feed uh, the uh, endocrine disrupting uh, substances assessment. And uh, uh, maybe mm, it's a good chance also to start reflecting on uh, uh, redefining the, the identification based on, in general, new approach methodologies. Um, there might be also some uh, uh, discussion or reflection on uh, uh, approaches to group substances uh, for cumulative assessment for uh, these particular class of uh, substances. So we want, uh, as, uh, as usual uh, in our events, but even more in this one, to really um, have an open discussion, open approach, exchange of views, uh, different views, challenges. So I recommend everybody to be very active in the chat to send challenging questions for, <laughs> for all of us. We want to get the best out of it. And uh, so this will uh, be possible uh, with you, absolutely. And so we want to, um, open the aim uh, and the ambition is to um, consider and uh, collect views for a possible uh, future uh, reconsideration, expansion of the current uh, um, uh, EFSA, ECA, GRC guidance document on endocrine disruptor. Uh, after some years of experience, uh, we all have collected views, uh, uh, ideas, and I think the, they should serve uh, as a basis to revise the uh, the approaches current in place. Uh, last but not least, um, I, I want to, uh, before handing over to our chair, uh, we are very, very pleased to have this session. Uh, you might have read it on our screen. Uh, it's in memory of our colleagues, uh, colleague Alfonso Lostia. Alfonso uh, passed away very young. Um, why we were in the making uh, on the thinking of this event no, two years ago. And he was very active and contributed to the AD uh, so much and, and enthusiastic. And we thought that what, uh, uh, what a, a possibility and nice way for us to remember him uh, with a scientific event. So in memory of Alfonso Lostia, I know many of you um, are with me in this moment. And uh, having said this, uh, um, I want to hand over to uh, our wonderful chair of today, Martin, Martin Wilkes. Okay, I will try to say a few words, but frankly, Martin doesn't need uh, a lot of uh, introduction. Martin has uh, a PhD in toxicology at the University of Surrey. And then uh, he has been director of the Swiss Center of Applied uh, Human Toxicology at the University of Basel, Geneva and Lausanne. Uh, since the very uh, beginning in, tw in 2009. And he was appointed also as adjunct professor uh, uh, at the medical faculty of the University of Geneva in 2012, and then also in Basel. Uh, what to say, uh, he's a pillar of our work. No, I have to go <laughs> ahead. He's a pillar of our work in EFSA, uh, enthusiastically contributing to our work and supporting us very much. So. Martin, who best could, could be chairing this session today. So I hand over to you and thank you very much. Th thank you very much, Manu, for this very kind introduction. And uh, 
I, uh, I'm not going to say much more, not to take any, any time away from the session, because we, we do have a very packed program this afternoon, which essentially falls into three parts. The first one will be a keynote lecture, um, followed by four brief poster pitch presentations, and I'll say a little bit more about those when the time comes. Um, and then after the coffee break, um, we have uh, flash presentations uh, reflecting the views of different stakeholder communities as far as endocrine disruption is concerned. Um, and those speakers will then also move on stage and have a moderated discussion afterwards. So, and we hope to have all of this finished by 1725. Um, and some of us have then uh, the opportunity to participate online um, with the community out there. So a very warm welcome from me uh, to all of you, both here in Brussels as well as online. Um, and um, the only thing I wanted to say about this event is that I'm particularly pleased that um, it actually reflects the spirit of this conference because it is built on the work of two agencies that have come together on a scientific topic and published guidance on how to deal with endocrine disruptors um, uh, in 2018. So it's the work of EFSA and ECHA, and I think this really reflects the one approach, and I think in the future we will and we should see more of this. So enough of that uh, by way of introduction, um, and I would like now to invite our keynote speaker, Andreas Kortenkamp, and if Manu said that I don't need introduction, I think Andreas is the one who <laughs> actually uh, needs, doesn't need introduction. You all know him. He's a professor of human toxicology at Brunel University in London, where he directs the Center for Pollution Research and Policy. And of course, Andreas has been involved with endocrine disruptors. I think the landmark report was published in 2009 um, that still bears his name. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Andreas for our keynote lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this kind introduction, and thank you very much for the um, invitation to present here this keynote lecture. Endocrine disruption across taxa, support for a one health perspective. How do I advance? I see. Um, it's, of course, impossible to summarize endocrine disruption in 20 minutes, so I thought I'd focus on an area that spawned initially this entire research area, the problem, the issue of reproduction. <coughs> this shows a graph from a rather recent study of uh, fertility centers. Uh, no fewer than uh, 100,000 men are involved there. Uh, I'd like you to focus on the blue mountain there with the uh, downward tra trajectory. This shows uh, the fraction of uh, men falling into categories of uh, insufficient total, uh, total motile sperm count. And you may know that motile sperm count is the most uh, important parameter to predict uh, fertility. It is going down. This echoes the findings from many other countries in the world, mostly um, Western countries, but recently we saw these uh, adverse trends also in, in China. Years of research on this topic um, have, has really advanced our knowledge on this, and uh, we now know a lot about the so-called male programming window here highlighted in this zone uh, on the, at the border between the first and second trimester of uh, pregnancy. It is here that the action of androgens and uh, many other signaling factors has to kick in to make a man a man. During this time, for example, um, <coughs> the number of Sertoli cells are programmed, the cells that can support uh, spermatozoa, and that will be the limit uh, for a man uh, for the rest of his life. We have to, of course, uh, think about expectant mothers. We need to, the, the target population for protection here, of course, is expectant mothers, because if in this time frame something goes wrong, the effects are irreversible and stay uh, for the rest of our lives. We know a lot now about the signaling pathways that uh, contribute to uh, disorders of this kind. And let me also remind you, we're not only talking about semen quality. Semen quality is a, is a predictor of uh, testis cancer. 
we are talking about a testicular dysgenesis syndrome where um, the risk of non-descending testes, hyperspadia, the spina malformation, testis cancer, poor semen quality are all linked. It is a syndrome. And this uh, chart here shows you the number uh, of signaling pathways that can contribute to these adverse outcomes. There are uh, a couple of surprises in there. Um, look at the bottom, prostaglandin signaling, that wasn't very much initially on anyone's horizon, but it turns out to be uh, an important contributor. So I thought, uh, following the motto of uh, this conference, One Health, um, this is recognizing connections between humans, wildlife, plants, and the ecosphere, or in the words of the late uh, Bernard Gigou, man and woman are animals like any other. So I thought in this spirit to draw together the evidence we have and uh, recently emerging evidence about the state of reproduction, not only in humans, but also in companion animals like dogs, in cetacean, killer whales, uh, harbor porpoises, and uh, polar bears. And let us see what we can glean from these, uh, at first perhaps, uh, disparate research areas. Can they fertilize each other? And what conclusions can we draw from insights in each of these areas? Let us begin with dogs. There's a, an interesting report by uh, Richard Lee and co-workers from Nottingham, where they noticed very much echoing what we see in the human a decline in sperm motility in stud dogs. You see here a massive decline in the decade between 88 and 1998, uh, uh, and also more recently there's still this downward trend. They made a great effort to come to the bottom of this, and here's another paper, uh, paper Rebecca Sumner, fairly recently published, where they uh, did a comparative study uh, among dogs from different geographic zones. Uh, the UK, and on the right, uh, Scandinavia. Up here you see the um, pathology score in dog testes, so the higher, the worse. And then they made an effort to um, see whether similar patterns exist with certain pollutants. So they do not claim um, causality in this paper, quite rightly so, but you see we have uh, similar patterns with the DEHP concentrations in, dead, uh, in dog uh, testes. PCB mm, doesn't fit so well and PBDE, um, debatable. But at least there is an effort to try and link these declines um, to um, pollution. Of course, um, <coughs> semen quality is not easily examined in uh, uh, sea mammals like harbor porpoises, uh, so we're, we have to look for uh, a proxy measure. And here's an interesting study uh, conducted by Rosie Williams where they um, investigated um, stranded harbor porpoises in these areas highlighted there around the coast of the United Kingdom. And very interestingly, they found an association between the PCB load in these animals and the size of the testes. The testes size is not only influenced by pollution, but also um, by nutrition. And what is so frightening of in this study is that you see here in this three-dimensional plot that among harbor por porpoises of good nutritional status, you see this downward trend with rising uh, PCB concentrations in testes weight. We do have a reproductive crisis in orcas. Uh, recent paper uh, published in Science by Desfork and colleagues. Um, based on a very interesting approach, this is a dose-response relationship among orcas, killer whales, uh, where they um, related the percent calf survival to the PCB load in the, in the mothers of, of these animals. Here's this plot. Um, the in highly polluted areas um, uh, in the Atlantic and other areas, the PCB concentrations in these orcas uh, currently fall in this window. And they went even a step further by modeling the impact of this on the uh, population trajectory among these uh, killer whales. So you see here, unexposed is the black curve, 
Uh, they did this for many parameters, I only highlight reproduction. At these loads in heavily polluted area, northeastern Greenland, around the UK coast, Strait of Grib Gibraltar and all, we do have a predicted downward trend in population development. And indeed, people observe that in certain parts of the North Atlantic, um, there are pods of orcas uh, that do not reproduce anymore at all. I've always believed that understanding endocrine disruption requires a mixtures perspective. And I'd like to return to the human field now and see what we can do and how this can inform the other fields of study. Um, the approach we are taking is called the hazard index, and those of you who were at the mixture session yesterday, nothing new for you here, but um, to put it very simply, uh, we know this uh, single chemical risk assessment approach making ratios of intake divided by a reference dose, a health-based guidance value. And if for a single chemical this ratio approaches one or exceeds one, risk manages um, spiral into action. In mixture risk assessment, we are <coughs> extending this approach and apply to all the chemicals considered together and demand that the sum of the so-called risk volume must stay below one. We've done this for declining semen qualities and based on this AOP network, which I showed you right at the beginning, um, chose chemicals that should, in our opinion, based on this AOP network, considered together for this exercise. You may know that um, <coughs> in the past, this area has uh, mostly only looked at phthalates. So here is the list of chemicals we included, dioxins, PPDEs, uh, PCBs, acrylamide, and so on and so forth, phthalates, bisphenols, and painkillers such as paracetamol. So the task for us was, in order to make the summing up of risk quotients um, uh, consistent, to identify doses for all of these chemicals uh, no longer associated with declines in semen quality. And what's more, uh, through a fortuitous uh, coincidence, we were able to collaborate <coughs> with researchers at the Ries Hospitaler in Copenhagen, Hanne Fridriksen, Anna-Marie Andersen, uh, the uh, Skakebeck group, um, who had uh, urine samples where they measured multiple chemicals in one and the same sample. This offered several advantages to us. First of all, the case that co-exposures happened was irrefutable. And what's more, mixture risk assessment could get personal. We were able to make a mixture risk assessment for each person they measured these nine chemicals together. Allow me to introduce the results of our finding from the perspective of single chemical risk assessment and with the question in mind, to what degree are we underestimating risks when we ignore the possibility of combined exposures? So let us begin here. To orient you, this chart on the x-axis uh, gives you a measure of combined risk. There's the vertical line in the middle, that's one uh, to the right of this is the red zone into which we do not want to get. To the left is no concern. The y-axis gives you a measure of the complexity of the mixture involved. So here is one phthalate. Um, you see all these dots at the bottom, one dot, one person, let me remind you. The complexity is one because there's no mixture effect. Now we're putting one more phthalate in. You see the complexity rises. Two movements happen. The dots move up and to the right. Next phthalate, next phthalate. Four phthalates, still no concern. No one is over the line. Five phthalates. We see the first persons appear in the red zone. But strikingly, this is where most evaluations, uh, mixture risk assessments in the past have stopped. But we were able to go further. Bisphenol F, you see half of the people over the line. Bisphenol S, the majority over the line. Bisphenol A and paracetamol. Everyone is over the line. So this is only based on the chemicals jointly me measured in these urine samples. 
So, um, but that's not the rest of, that's not all of it. There are about 20 chemicals where we did not have these simultaneous measurements, um, but we knew they are around when we put them in as well. Uh, 20 background chemicals among them, the dioxins, <coughs> we see everyone is in the red zone and um, by often some individuals quite considerable uh, factor. Uh, up to 100 fold over combined acceptable concentration. The median is about uh, 17 to 20 fold. Now that doesn't tell you anything about the chemicals that really are behind it and the chemicals that drive it. So I show you this for a scenario of, uh, of median uh, polluted individuals. So this is a plot where we rank the risk quotients uh, according to order. And um, please watch the horizontal line where, uh, which equals one. It tells you that up to this um, crossing point here, all the chemicals below that line together um, would sum up to acceptable combined exposure. You see here that now these chemicals begin to poke their head above this line. We call them the drivers of mixture risk. And we can name these chemicals. The biggest impact, bisphenol A, followed by paracetamol. That's a surprise. Followed by the dioxins, bisphenol S, F, and then the first phthalate. That's the second surprise to us. The most people in this area were very concerned about phthalates. They do matter, I'm not arguing them away, but we have missed the big drivers. And charts like that tell risk managers which chemicals they could target with uh, maximum effect on, on the protection of health of individuals. So these would, uh, would be all the bisphenols, uh, paracetamol, um, there's good evidence that women, when they take paracetamol um, at the end of the first trimester, beginning of second, uh, increase the risk of their sons uh, of having uh, non-descending testes. Animal experiments show us uh, there are declines in semen quality. This is, the medical profession doesn't like to hear this, but I think we should shout more about it. Um, there's a consensus article published uh, some years ago by no fewer than 99 scientists calling on women to be careful with paracetamol in pregnancy and if possible, forgo it. Now, how does that look? What can we learn from this uh, reflecting back on the One Health philosophy on our companion animals, the dogs? Okay, um, the, they looked at DHP, PCBs and PBDEs, but maybe if you want to um, investigate the extent further and perhaps see uh, better uh, associations with pollutant patterns, uh, the case study we did among human for humans would perhaps tell us to take into account bisphenols and the dioxins as well. In orcas, um, the situation is sadly such that the um, game of play is very much dominated by PCBs. Um, second uh, rank, the PBDEs and then the dioxins. There is a question, um, I'm putting it out here, I'm not sure this will lead to anywhere, but perhaps looking at phthalates and bisphenols uh, with a view of saying, okay, PCBs, PBDEs, all the pops are out there, we can't do much to get them back, but we want to avoid that we are adding to this already bad scenario by putting other chemicals uh, into the pot for these whales as well. Here is uh, a chart which I've taken from a paper by Jepson which shows you the situation PCB levels found in various cetaceans. Um, it's not a surprise that uh, top predators like orcas, especially when they eat seals, have incredibly high PCB levels. The um, reproductive impairment level in seals is estimated to be here, and you see that apart from harbor porpoises, all the others are over that limit. Uh, the PCB levels in mother's milk are currently around here, just to orient you a little. Here is a very interesting paper by uh, Dietz and co-workers where they tried, um, this is the first example I see where they tried a mixture risk assessment approach very similar to what I've shown you for humans a few minutes ago. 
but in polar bears. Um, what, so you see here, they looked at various chemicals. Here there are the perfluorinated among them. And uh, the sum, the black line, is the sum of these risk quotients. And just below there is in red the PCBs. This chart shows you that PCBs uh, in polar bears almost entirely explain the reproductive risks. The other chemicals are there, but they don't contribute very much. But I guess we could gain from keeping an eye on that um, also to ensure the situation doesn't get worse. What about the dioxins? Uh, I think they might be looked at to gain a full impression of the extent of the problem in polar bears. The One Health perspective then highlights for us the need for horizontal ED criteria. And that's one thing that ca comes out for me in terms of actionable research evidence from our case study of semen quality in humans. Paracetamol. Has anyone thought about listing this as an EDC? I think there's a very strong case. This One Health perspective also identifies different risk drivers in these different uh, animals. We have PCBs and dioxins in apex predators, especially um, sea mammals. The situation is uh, very likely more complex in humans and companion animals. Research in companion animals has the advantage of uh, being able to do this in a rather controlled environment uh, with very consistent methods applied uniformly. That's often a problem uh, in human populations and quite uh, recognized. So uh, we could sort of in a parallelogram approach advance perhaps research in companion animals uh, in order to learn more about uh, the risks to us and vice versa. From this, one could derive different policy needs. For example, in apex uh, predators, we've seen, in my opinion, there is, a, there is a compliance issue. PCBs have been regulated for a very long time. We still have a PCB problem in these uh, predators, uh, sea mammals, polar bears in particular. The question arises, why is that? Uh, we also need uh, and can derive from this new measures uh, for human health. The chart I've shown you for, from our risk assessment as I said, immediately informs risk managers uh, uh, in terms of what chemicals to focus on with maximum gain. France has imposed a ban on bisphenol A in all food contact materials. Um, my proposal would be to extend this to all bisphenols and um, uh, see how far we get there. There's some urgent action needed, in my opinion, to make progress in this area. It also highlights new directions for research and risk assessment in human companion animals and wildlife. Some final thoughts. I mentioned this already. Why precisely do we have a PCB problem in these uh, apex predators? I do understand uh, there are legacy pollutants and sea mammals of this kind live for a long time. But still, uh, in researching this for this presentation, I have to say I was a little taken aback by the extent of this problem. Basic provisions for protection in food are missing from EU food law, um, and I'm referring specifically to the directive that sets maximum residue limits for uh, food contaminants. For this, first of all, I would argue we need a mandate for looking at mixture effects in this, um, in this directive and this area, which is currently missing, and yesterday we heard the European Commission has currently no intention of uh, working on this. And secondly, as a first measure, this directive needs to be updated. Uh, um, there's nothing uh, uh, about PBDEs in there, bisphenol, phthalates, or paracetamol. Depriving risk managers of the last resort of uh, risk management measures. I know this is end of the pipe, but I think this directive needs to be updated urgently. With these thoughts, I thank you for your attention and look forward to some questions you might have.
Thank you very much, Andreas, for these very stimulating and thought-provoking uh, thoughts that you shared with us. Um, we have time for a few questions, and I want to start something with... Um, oh, it just disappeared from <laughs> the first question I had. But I'll, I'll take the one that I've got on screen now uh, from Dorota Napierska, which says, apart from PCBs and other chemicals sh that you've shown, has anyone studied a link between mercury concentrations in marine mammals? And I for, um, didn't see the last question because it's disappeared just now. Um, but I think it was around mercury and potentially other pollutants uh, like that in Yes, mer that mercury, uh, methyl mercury in particular, the, uh, we're, we're concerned about that in, in, in relation to uh, neurodevelopmental effects. Um, I don't think, I haven't seen very, st very strong evidence that this is um, um, an association with reproduction as well. And so f for the purposes of this talk, I focused on reproduction. Okay, thank you for that. Then there's a question from, from Gisela Degen. Is the finding of paracetamol being a driver in humans uh, related to interfering with prostaglandin synthesis? And if that is the case, what about other non-steroidals? Very good question. Yes, indeed, it is, it is related to uh, prostaglandin signaling. Uh, I have to stress, um, that's also a surprise. We found, um, biomonitoring studies have found paracetamol in everyone's urine, even urine from paracetamol non-users like, like myself, for example. Um, why? Well, number one, it's in the food chain because it's used in, in, the, in poultry farming and pig farming. Uh, but very much to <laughs> the surprise of everyone, it, um, it can be synthesized by our bodies from aniline. We are all exposed to aniline. So the, the, you have a background level of paracetamol, everyone. Uh, that is, according to our analysis, not of concern. What, what I've shown here is for those who use paracetamol, especially in this male programming window. That's... Uh, Women should, expectant mothers should be told more about it. I know the medical profession doesn't like it. We tried to publish some of these uh, papers of ours in the medical literature. It was always bounced. Um, we published in environmental uh, journals. Now it's out there. But the medical profession should know more about this. Very interesting and also uh, showing that we, we do need this cross-silo uh, yeah. approach to these matters. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, uh, Laurent Lagardic, uh, first of all, uh, congratulating you on your presentation and basically saying you are um, using here and I guess also advocating a, a risk-based approach to environmental exposure to chemicals. Um, Whereas um, what we're seeing from the Commission, uh, at least according here, is more looking at a hazard-based approach and not accounting for exposure. Um, so when we look at the identification of risk drivers of endocrine disruption, isn't there something wrong in the way endocrine disruption is evaluated at EU level? No, I don't think we, we do need hazard-based cutoff criteria. That's a political decision which I endorse. The philosophy is s same as with carcinogens uh, for pesticides. You don't want carcinogenic pesticides out there. Uh, in the past, that was permitted. Uh, a risk assessment was needed to say, okay, are the risks acceptable? Uh, the, the um, new uh, plant protection product regulation has done away with this, and for these severe forms of toxicity introduced hazard-based cutoff criteria, which also apply to endocrine disruptor, reproductive toxicants, and mutagen. So I'm uh, fully in support of this philosophy. Of course, um, that doesn't preclude us from doing risk assessment for endocrine disruptors. That's risk assessment. From that follow and flow some risk management options, um, but of course we have to do risk assessment for endocrine disruptors, but that's not to contradict or criticize the current regulatory philosophy in European law. Thank you for that. I think we, we take one more, well, one last yeah. question uh, by, by Lisa Baumann. Um, great presentation, Andreas. There you are. Um, can you Thank say anything you. about the life circumstances of the people with the highest exposure values? Where do they live? Uh, what do they eat? Th that sort of thing. 
Yes, that's a, that's a question that puzzles us. Um, so these individuals, these persons which were, who were um, hundredfold over the limit, um, their exposures were almost entirely explained by one chemical, bisphenol A, and we wondered why that is. Is this just a spotlight? Have they just eaten a tin of tomatoes? Or what's going on? We can't answer this, but it's a, it's a very important question to, to look at and, and to follow up. But this is, uh, this is a peculiar trend. Um, I hadn't had the time to elaborate on this, but highly, highly exposed people, um, the, the, the complexity of the mixtures they experience is, is lower than the ones, say, in the middle range. This, this is typical, uh, a typical phenomenon we observed. It was discussed yesterday in the mixture session. It has to do with the power laws and the Pareto principle. Um, 20% of the chemicals in the mixture explain 80% of the effect. Uh, it's also visible in this chart I showed you with the drivers. Thank you, Andreas. And Thank you. once more, give Andreas a big hand for the presentation. <laughs> and we will, of course, see you later um, in the uh, moderated panel discussion. So we're moving on now to the next part of uh, this session, and that is introducing uh, the poster pitch. And um, the way this is works is that we have selected four of the posters that are on display. So if you haven't seen the posters yet, you can look at them online, you can look at them through the event app, or if you're here in Brussels, um, you can also go downstairs and, and look at them in the place where we have coffee and lunches. So um, you can look at those, and the presenters of those posters have uh, five minutes each to make their pitch. There will not be a discussion, uh, because that simply wouldn't work time-wise. So uh, we will have those five presentations, one after the other, and then go into the coffee break. So our first presenter is Donna McMillan, and Donna is a senior strategist for regulatory science in the research and toxicology department at the Humane Society International. And her presentation will be on identifying endocrine disruptors, thoughts and recommendations for implementation in the EU. Donna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give um, a poster pitch. I've been really looking forward to today's session and I think um, it will be um, really exciting um, science discussed. Um, so I'm pretty sure everyone in the room knows what an endocrine disruptor is. Uh, if not, they're substances that interact with uh, natural hormones in uh, humans and other animals and can lead to issues with reproduction, as we've already um, just heard about, as well as growth and um, metabolism. Now, suspected endocrine disruptors um, are a big problem and the European Commission have uh, proposed a solution to try and deal with these. Um, and under the chemical uh, strategy for sustainability, uh, they have proposed that uh, these substances are regulated by the addition of a new hazard class under the classification and labeling regulation and the introduction of new endocrine specific information requirements um, in the REACH regulation. Now, at face value, this is a great idea. We need to regulate these chemicals, um, but there is a problem with the, the approach that's been uh, proposed um, by the European Commission in that the in vivo tests that have been um, suggested um, are unsuitable and the uh, in vitro tests uh, are not applied um, appropriately. Um, this combination, this uh, strategy that's been proposed will mean that millions of um, animals are used purely to regulate these endocrine disruptors, but without actually conferring additional protection of human health um, and the environment. So we have what we think is the, the real solution 
um, and these are shown on these um, little circles on the right hand side which hopefully you can read. Um, a lot of this has already been discussed um, at the NAM session this morning if you were there but the idea would be that we begin with a robust battery of new approach methods for example in vitro assays and this would give us um, the um, an indication of the ED potential um, of a given substance. Then if needed we would then move on to a mechanistic pathway based uh, approach that looks at um, deriving a quantitative and reproducible um, outcome. So for example, a point of departure or some sort of lowest um, effect level. And the idea would be that you use those in an integrated approach to testing and assessment that is developed purely for uh, regulatory um, purposes. But in order to do that, we need to understand the, chem the uh, biology associated with endocrine uh, disruptors comprehensively. So there has to be a lot more work done on understanding the adverse outcome pathways, um, which of course is um, an ongoing project. And then we believe that these can all be used um, in combination to ensure that the um, regulation of endocrine disruptors in the EU um, ensures the um, protection of health for, uh, sorry, for human health and uh, the environment. And my timer has just gone, so I will end there and hand over to the next uh, speaker. Thank, thank you very much, Donna, and thank you for sticking to the time that is much appreciated. So without further ado, I move on to our next speaker, and that's Lucia Verhauen and she's a postdoctoral researcher and project coordinator in the Zebrafish uh, lab at the University of Antwerp. And her presentation is on evaluation of an adverse outcome pathway network for thyroid hormone system disruption across taxonomic groups. L Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for allowing me to briefly pitch my poster. Um, so, previous speakers have been talking mostly about sex hormone disruption. I will be talking about disruption of the thyroid hormone system. Um, this is something of concern. We're uh, aware that multiple chemicals can disrupt the thyroid hormone system and this leads to effects on development, for example, across vertebrate species. And the methods to evaluate thyroid hormone system disruption are currently mostly lacking, and that's both in a human toxicology context and in an ecological context. So there's an opportunity here to uh, develop a common strategy with a battery of assays and also using extrapolation across species. This study is a collaboration between University of Antwerp, University of Heidelberg, and University of Southern Denmark, funded under the Ergo project uh, by the Horizon 2020 framework, in collaboration with uh, partners at Environment and Climate Change Canada and the US EPA. We are using an AOP, Adverse Outcome Pathway Network, based approach to support cross species extrapolation. When assembling all of the AOPs that are being developed on thyroid hormone system disruption, we get a cross-species AOP network, and this is what you see here on the slide. And we indicate here with the colored boxes beneath the key events to which taxa these key events are applicable, at least according to what is currently available uh, concerning information on the taxonomic domain of applicability in the AOP wiki. In this study, we are working on uh, evaluating and advancing the taxonomic domain of applicability of this AOP network, which means that we are investigating to which extent different parts of the network are applicable to more than one species and across vertebrate species and across vertebrate taxa. So in order to do this, um, we start with an approach where we use the MIEs and the AOs as anchor points. So we start with assessing the molecular initiating events, where we use the CKPAS tool to study structural conservation of the targets in the thyroid axis that are perturbed by the chemicals. 
And we combine this with a literature review where we look for studies that have demonstrated occurrence of the molecular initiating event in different species. This is an example for inhibition of the sodium iodide symporter. And you can see that the CKPAS tool clearly shows a high level of structural conservation of the target across vertebrate species. Next, we go to the adverse outcomes in the network. And for each adverse outcome, we use a literature review to study whether the adverse outcome occurs across different vertebrate species and across different vertebrate taxa. And I added an example here for developmental neurotoxicity, and I should stress here that this is in the context of thyroid hormone system disruption, so with altered thyroid hormone levels. And for, so for DNT, uh, it's clear that AOPs have been developed for mammals, not yet for other vertebrate taxa, but there's a lot of information in the literature suggesting that it is applicable across vertebrate taxa. So then we use these two anchor points, the MIEs and the AOs, to prioritize parts of the AOP network and full AOPs to do a further, more detailed characterization of the taxonomic domain of applicability. Once this uh, domain of applicability is better established, we can start using this to extrapolate from one species to another, and this will facilitate the use of fish and amphibian models for mammalian health and vice versa. And importantly, it will also facilitate the use of fish and amphibian embryos as nouns uh, to evaluate thyroid hormone system disruption. As an example of how this can be used, we are developing a set of um, fish assays, endpoints, that are based on AOPs uh, to evaluate thyroid hormone system disruption. This includes swim bladder inflation, eye development, uh, hormone levels, and thyroid histopathology. And we are adding these uh, AOP-based endpoints to existing fish test guidelines by integrating Project 135 on the OECD AOP development work plan. This is where we're developing the AOPs in fish with project 264 on the work plan for the test guidelines program, which is where we're adding the endpoints to the existing FISH test guidelines. So by doing this, by adding these endpoints and by having a battery of assays and then using that taxonomic domain of applicability of the AOP network, we can support the extrapolation from FISH embryo endpoints to uh, several um, vertebrate species and use it for human health as well as for environmental health. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for this presentation. Um, our next speaker is also a person who doesn't actually need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway, Albert Piersma. Um, he's a professor of reproductive toxicology at the Institute of Risk Assessment Science in Utrecht, and he's also a senior scientist at Public Health uh, Institute for Public Health and Environment, RIVM, and he's going to talk about developing a quantitative AOP for liver-mediated thyroid modulation after prenatal exposure to a xenobiotic compound in rats. Albert, please. Thank you, Martin, and, and thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, brief pitch of my poster. Um, let me see if I can do get the first slide here. Yes. Um, well, the thyroid system was already introduced and its importance for endocrine disruption. Um, a question that has come up uh, in relation to the thyroid system is the question of whether liver metabolism um, uh, changes due to uh, xenobiotic exposures, to what extent would it affect the thyroid system? We know that there is an interaction between the liver and uh, the thyroid, uh, thyroid homeostasis, and with that, whether the thyroid homeostasis could be uh, affected to such an extent that endocrine disruption would occur, meaning adverse outcomes in the end. So um, the question came up uh, basically because in the developmental toxicity study, the OECD test guideline 414, um, we, it is now mandatory to, uh, to addre address or assess the T4 and T3 levels. Uh, and of course, the question is, how do we interpret that in the light of adverse outcomes? Uh, how can we, can we link those two together, or are they, uh, are they fully independent, and is that problematic? So what we did was we, uh, we designed a study uh, in which we did uh, the, the prenatal developmental toxicity study design with an exposure from gestation day six to gestation day 20 in pregnancy in rats 
um, and we exposed the system to uh, PCN, which is a compound that is a, a pregnant X receptor <laughs> agonist, um, which induces hepatic uh, UGT1A isozymes uh, and increases T4 glucuronidation with uh, downstream consequences. We did a very broad dose response curve uh, in order to be able to, uh, to, to compare the different responses at different levels. Um, we looked at different um, um, moments during the whole, um, the whole exposure period and after that, gestation day 16, 21, postnatal day 4 and postnatal day 21, we, um, we uh, derived a host of, uh, of organs as you can see here uh, and as is detailed on our poster and we did a, a lot of assessments on, for instance, gene expression, hormone levels, enzyme levels and so forth. Um, and um, uh, the results are briefly given here in an AOP framework like, uh, like um, uh, layout. Um, and basically what we showed was that um, in the liver there was a lot of C, uh, CYP induction, uh, UGT induction, sulfatase, uh, sul sulfatase induction, um, and D3 induction. So there is on the maternal side, and this is the gestation day 21 situation, uh, there was a lot of things happening in the liver when it comes to regulation of, um, uh, of enzyme uh, levels, um, gene expression, as well as uh, thyroid hormones. Um, also in the blood of the, of the mothers, we saw those changes in T4 and T3. Uh, but lo and behold, looking into the fetuses at the, at the same uh, time, we did not see any changes in uh, thyroid hormones. Um, this is work in progress, so we're still looking into the... Um, into the adverse outcomes in this study, uh, so I can't give you the final, uh, the final verdict. And of course, the question here is, uh, is this really uh, a, a, an example of good homeostasis within the pregnant animal that, uh, that, that protects the fetus, or should we look at different time points, for instance, or, sh or should we look at different endpoints? So we're diving into that much more now, um, and I'm happy to give you, uh, to give you more information uh, when you visit the poster uh, or, or otherwise. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, and our final speaker in this session is Kevin Schlüppmann. Uh, Kevin is a PhD student in the laboratory of Ellen Fritsche um, at the Leibniz Center in, in Düsseldorf. And he is going to present on refining EDC hazard assessment by integrating an in vitro testing battery for ED-induced developmental neurotoxicity. Kevin, please. Thank you for the introduction, and also I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present my poster. Uh, and I would be happy to meet some of you later to discuss everything in more detail. Okay. So first of all, hormones are involved in numerous metabolic and developmental processes. Nevertheless, the effects of only few hormones during brain development are known. These include androgen and estrogen receptor mediating sexual differentiation and development of socioaggressive behavior, retinoic acid receptor regulating hindbrain patterning and neural tube closure, and thyroid hormones playing key roles in neurodevelopmental processes. However, the roles of several other hormone receptors in neurodevelopmental processes have only scarcely been investigated. Therefore, there is a large data gap regarding the influence of hormone receptors during brain development. To close this data gap, we identified hormone-sensitive neurodevelopmental key events by activation and inactivation of 14 hormone receptors using the human neurosphere assay, a multiplexed high-content medium-throughput assay that is based on human neural progenitor cells that are cultivated as three-dimensional cell aggregates, so-called neurospheres. The, ne uh, the neurosphere assay allows the depiction of several neurodevelopmental key events, including neural progenitor cell proliferation and radial glia cell migration. Here in this video, you can see radial glia cells migrating out of the sphere core, forming a circular migration area. Within this migration area, O4 positive oligodendrocytes and beta-3 tubulin positive neurons are identified by an in-house developed software using artificial intelligence. Um, applying this test system, we um, investigated how hormone receptor agonists and antagonists affect these neurodevelopmental key events. And here you can see the effects of activation and inactivation of the 14 hormone receptors on the key events assessed in the neurosphere assay, uh, with blue showing reducing effects and red showing inducing effects. I mainly want to highlight that activation or inactivation of 13 of the 14 hormone receptors 
affected at least one neurodevelopmental key event, with oligodendrocyte differentiation being the endpoint most often affected. Moreover, we observed that activation of glucocorticoid receptor and liver X receptor elicit sex-dependent effects. So to conclude, hormone receptor agonists and antagonists regulate basic human neurodevelopmental key events in vitro. And using this data as a basis, we now aim to develop human-based in vitro EDDNT test methods to increase predictivity and therefore chemical safety by integrating these methods into regulatory risk assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and that takes us to the end of the session. I would like to thank our keynote speaker and all the poster pitch presenters for very stimulating lectures. I'm sure there's lots of questions that I hope you will discuss over coffee. And we'll see you back at 3.25 sharp for the next session. Thank you. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I, I hope you had a good discussion, some coffee, some water, and maybe some air in between. Um, so the session that we're now em embarking on uh, is called Flash Reports. And the idea behind it is that we have invited um, people working in different stakeholder sectors um, to uh, express their views with regard to implementation of endocrine disruptor um, guidance and work from the perspective of the different stakeholder groups. Um, so it's important to remember that we, are, we have invited individuals. We haven't invited organizations or anything to, um, uh, to, to present a view of an organization. So these are individual views, but of course they come from different perspectives, and that is the idea. So interestingly, we have seven presenters for six presentations. I'll tell you how that's gonna work out in a minute. Um, and um, we'll, we'll call them up one by one. They have seven minutes each to present their views, and at the end of that, then everybody hopefully will sit on stage, and I will hand over to our moderators for the moderated panel discussion. So um, without further ado, our first uh, presenter is Henrik Holbeck, and uh, he is um, an academic. So Henrik is Associate Professor and Research Group Leader in the Department of Biology at Southern Denmark University. Um, and um, Henrik, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, event. I don't know if I should thank the NAM session for setting the scene for putting me in bad standing now, talking about in vivo testing. <laughs> we'll see in a minute or two. Okay, um, I was invited to, uh, to give the view from my own academic perspective to, uh, on what works well and uh, what uh, could be improved in, uh, in assessment of EDs. Um, so I'll go into uh, the hazard identification and, uh, and regulation of, uh, of EDs. And of course, uh, to do a regulation, uh, you need to, uh, to identify uh, the hazard. So uh, the hazard identification of EDs is actually a showstopper if we, uh, if we don't have the methods. Uh, fortunately, we have a toolbox that is uh, being developed all the time, um, but we also need to use the toolbox to regulate. Uh, the toolbox I talk about is, of course, the OCD uh, conceptual frame framework uh, containing all the validated uh, test guidelines related to, to EDs. So what should the toolbox actually support to be effective and protective? Um, and here I think that identification of the EDs uh, should be related to how they uh, exert their effects. Uh, the different uh, axes they work on. Uh, they should cover the different uh, parts of the endocrine system at sensitive life stages in the relevant species. And I want to point out, I'm an ecotoxicologist. I don't care much about humans, so now I will give the environment <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of fame, hopefully. So the, the right part of the, of the figure here is what is, uh, concerns me most. Um, going to what we actually have uh, in the toolbox. We have already heard from several presenters, uh, EAS partly T is uh, at least partly covered. Um, 
for mammals, we've heard that, and of course we use mammals to extrapolate to uh, um, mammals in the environment. We have uh, a number of fish tests that especially are, are relevant for EANS. It will soon be for T. Um, amphibians, yes, for T, and uh, partly for EA and S. Birds, not very much, not very specific. We have a repo test. Reptiles, no. And what about invertebrates? More than 95% of all species, um, no. We have some reproduction tests, but we don't have any specific uh, ED-related endpoints. <coughs> that was a good part. Now we go to the non-EAST modalities, and that can actually be quite fast. You can see all the minuses because we don't have much. Um, many of you probably participated in the workshop in uh, 2018, or 2017, sorry, arranged by the commission on setting the priorities for, for, for the gaps and, uh, and testing. I just took out a few examples here that was prioritized at this workshop. Um, I don't know if you can tell if any of these have now been uh, are even in progress to be evaluated or validated. I'm not sure. Um, another point there from the Ecotox part, we mostly do aquatic exposure. Um, we don't have proper guidance on, for example, how to handle difficult substances that are difficult to uh, uh, dissolve in water. So we need much more work on that part also. Okay, but how do we improve uh, what we have? Um, and how do we improve regulation? I dare also to talk a little bit about regulation, even though coming from academia, um, we already heard from Lucia on the AOP network, there is a potential of, uh, of cross-species uh, and cross-classes extrapolation, uh, especially for parts of the, of the endocrine system that is well conserved. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of in initiatives on this also at the, at the EU level and at the, the global OECD level. Um, Regular improvements, we have heard about it before, but uh, of course we have asked for many years for updates of the REACH uh, um, uh, standard uh, information requirements to include um, the tests that are in the toolbox, and that of course supports the vision of uh, horizontal criteria uh, in the EU. Okay, so what should we focus on? And we have heard a lot about it uh, the last days. Uh, fully support that, uh, that we use NAMS. Um, embryo tests are also considered as NAMS. Um, invertebrates, some of them at least, are considered as NAMS. So this about one life is a life is actually not quite true for all animals. Um, yeah, AOPs. We've seen it before. And then in considera consideration to the three R's, I uh, think it's important to look at the existing guidelines we have and optimize them and get every knowledge out of the test we actually do. Uh, so refining the existing guidelines with more endpoints, um, mechanistic uh, molecular endpoints. And of course, I would like to focus on invertebrates also. And why that? because invertebrates also need protection. Uh, if you look at the EFSA ECA guidance document, it just states that we don't know enough, so we don't consider invertebrates, invertebrates unless there is specific knowledge that could be taken into account. Um, fortunately, most of them can actually be regarded as NAMs, so they don't count in the, in the system, but that's not why we should work on them. It's because they need protection. I was asked to put in like one or two uh, keywords, take home messages, and uh, I know it's a bit provocative maybe after the morning session, but I think we should think of the wildlife also for animal protection and animal welfare. And therefore we should only change from full in vivo testing to full NAM testing when we have protective NAMs. 
and it's been discussed what is that actually, but protective for all the species in the environment. I'm over time now. So, and the next one is bi biodiversity because, for example, the invertebrates drive biodiversity. And just to put it in perspective, the EU number of fish used for research and regulatory purposes in a year is less than one or 0.1% of the fish we catch in Denmark for animal food suffocating every year, just to put it in pers perspective. So please make them safe before we change from in vivo testing. I think that was it. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik. And I'd, I'd invite you to, to take a chair on stage. And um, we're, we're moving straight on to our next speaker, who is um, reporting on an industry view. And Dan Pickford is an ecotoxicologist and principal technical expert at Syngenta Product Safety. So, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting Crop Life Europe, or CLE as I'm going to call it, um, to provide our view as notifiers on the EV evaluation process in the EU. Um, as Martin mentioned, I'm an ec ecotoxicologist, but I'm here to represent really the views of the CLE EV expert group, which comprises toxicologists as well as ecotoxicologists, and we've got collectively experience of uh, endocrine, thank you very much, uh, experience and expertise in conducting ED evaluation and understanding endocrine disruption in human health and in non-target organisms, and that reflects the scope of the guidance document, which we're we'll coming on to. And the scope of that document is primarily on vertebrates, because we know most about those at the moment, um, and on four main modalities, estrogen, androgen, thyroid, and steroidogenesis, EATS. Um, and I've introduced those because I'm going to use them in the next few slides. Um, overall, our view is that um, the weight of evidence approach for assessing EAS-mediated adversity is pretty robust. It's the, the guidance is, enables us to see quite clearly what data we need for evaluation of EAS-mediated adversity, um, and we can get some fairly good decisions out of it. Uh, oops. The aim of the legislation, obviously, is to exclude from the European market substances which are causing adverse effects subsequent or through interaction with the endocrine targets, and it therefore stands to reason that it's very important that we can differentiate such effects from those which are secondary to systemic toxicity. And that's enshrined in the criteria that we've got, and it also runs throughout the ED guidance document, um, which is very good. Perhaps the less easy bit is looking at the results of studies and where we're getting data which may be quite noisy, and it really tests our ability to differentiate between systemic and specific toxicity. Uh, so in human health, we would say that we've, we probably see that, again, EAS-mediated activity, we're getting, we can get quite good, deci reasonable decisions. It's fairly robust, and we're seeing a good differentiation between systemic and specific endocrine-mediated activity in some of the assessments we've done to date. Um, that said, the MTD, as a definition we've inherited, is pretty restricted, and it relies on some elements which aren't routinely uh, available from some studies that we conduct for ED evaluations, which can be problematic, and we would recommend that that MTD definition is revisited in the context of the ED evaluations. For non-target organisms, similarly, uh, we have an MTC definition which varies fairly widely among test guidelines. Um, that can be problematic because we have somewhat variable perception among member states about how much we need to demonstrate systemic toxicity in our testing. Uh, that can lead to loss of information because we have a limited number of test concentrations. Uh, and if we lose one essentially to systemic toxicity at the top, then we're not really left with much to establish concentration response relationships, which are quite important in establishing um, you know, the, the reliability of effects. So um, we also would really urge consideration of sub-lethal responses 
in that definition of a maximum tolerable concentration. They're currently not addressed, and that is again causing a loss of information. Growth is responsive to systemic toxicity, but also obviously it's recognised as being potentially sensitive to endocrine activity in the guidance. So there's clearly a conflict there, and we need to be able to separate. Um, considering thyroid axis, in humans, the view of uh, notifiers, I think, pretty universally is that the Appendix A of the guidance document gives a rather inconsistent view of the relevance of findings in um, relation to the thyroid axis in lab models, particularly the rat, which is, as we know, an exceptionally sensitive organism in relation to thyroid axis perturbation. Um, and we need further guidance, and I think we, need, we, we would call for a, a further revision of that Appendix A to provide a tiered testing strategy to enable um, an understanding of the relevance of any effects in lab, spe lab species. Um, and this could hopefully uh, use NARMS and result in the minimization of animal testing. Moving to non-target organisms, a key thing we need is better guidance on establishing population relevance of adversity. We are required to do that in the criteria. It's recommended in the guidance, and we have really no tools and very little guidance to do that. Um, so we would urge more guidance, which specifically would revisit the utility and the acceptability of population modelling as a tool to establish population relevance without, without that it's really quite hard to do, especially when you consider that the criteria ask us to demonstrate that adverse effects are not population relevant. Um, and as we know, we can't prove a negative. So we are in quite a sticky situation. Um, going to in vitro assays. In human health, we have a number of in vitro assays, um, which, and we believe the guidance for that is not really fit for purpose. We have some targets where we don't really have agreed or validated test methods. More importantly, perhaps we have some assays such as the HGNI5R assay, which are very sensitive and appear to provide, give quite high false positive rates, which is further exacerbated by the fact that that study can trigger higher tier animal testing, which is quite intensive. Um, and we believe that that really requires revisiting. Um, furthermore, guidance on how to interpret the results of in vitro testing through PVBK models, among other IV, IVE methods, would be useful to establish physiological relevance, and that speaks to the aspect of establishing you know, the hazard potential. And in non-target organisms, again, we've got, we've got a tiered approach. You can see it as it should be a toolbox approach. Higher tiers, we've got some studies which are not well validated and not robust and probably can't be delivered by a CRO currently. Um, and so when we're triggered to do those by lower tiers, um, that is potentially a great difficulty. Uh, in conclusion, we would really recommend that we are able to use, make full use of the, of the dossiers, all the information so that we can establish a true weight of evidence evaluation. Examples such as triggering a two-gen study from an in vitro assay with a high false positive rate are a good example of where we're not using, we're not enabled to, not able to use a weight of evidence approach. Um, and another picture of a toolbox, pleased to see that in Henrik's presentation. Um, we see the OECD framework as a toolbox, and we should take a hypothesis-based approach to testing and using different levels, and that should enable us to make better decisions and minimise animal use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, um, for this view. And we're moving on to uh, the, a view from a European agency. And... Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Sander van der Linden, uh, who is working at the Chemicals Agency in, in Helsinki and is in the uh, Biocides Active Substances Unit. Um, and before that, in, in a former life, uh, Sander was also involved at JRC with uh, contributing to the um, current ECA EFSA guidance on ED. So, um, Sander, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'll be presenting a bit the view of the, uh, of the agencies uh, overall, so not specifically on the biocide unit. And I think when it comes to the agencies, that's very clear that at the moment there's a regulatory requirement to, to assess endocrine disruptors uh, of all the substances that we have on the European market. And this is specifically true for two substances, uh, which is the biocide and the pesticides. And this is because that the regulatory text that we have for those two substances or groups of substances uh, very clearly mentioned that if a substance is considered to be an endocrine disruptor, it basically should not be allowed on the European market. 
and what, what goes well, I think, from an agency point of view is that at least the two criteria, even though managed by two different agencies, they use the same criteria to, to see what is an equity crime disruptor. And in combination, actually, they published uh, this, uh, this guidance that was mentioned before. And this was the first time that the two agencies involved, EFSA and NECA, with the contribution of the GRC, produced a single guidance to look at a single topic instead of two independent guidances. And of course, this helps in avoiding diverging conclusions later on in the, um, in the process. Of course, the downside is when it comes to what can be better, as mentioned before by both Hendrik and Dan, is that the guidance, of course, could only uh, point towards models that are, that are accepted and that are working. Of course, we know that the ED criteria itself, they don't specify specific modality, but we can only work with where we have models to understand the, uh, the mechanisms involved. Of course, there are different regulations at play also when it comes to endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruptors can be identified on a reach on the Article 57F. Uh, and in the near future, we'll probably have also an ED hazard class under the CLP regulation. But what will be helpful if at least all the regulations, they work with the same definition of what is an endocrine disruptor. And of course, this then fits into the strategy of what was mentioned this morning also a couple of times for the chemical strategy, and that we want to have one substance, one assessment, and that all the substance, regardless of the regulatory framework under which it is assessed, will come up with the same conclusion. So of course, from the agency point of view, what happens when we receive a dossier for a substance, so we have the discussions at the working group, and there we look at the, um, uh, the, the classical discussion whether there's evidence for adversity. But of course, this time we need to look at the adversity with an ED mode of action in mind. So that's not just relying on the apical endpoints that we've assessed always in the same way, but suddenly we need to discuss whether there's also sufficient evidence for endocrine activity. So is there evidence for the perturbation of the endocrine system? And this is problematic in a way because we need to link, be able to link the two, but at the moment, frequently, we don't have sufficient information to say whether the endocrine system is perturbed or not. And this would require additional testing. So on the one hand, we want to have additional tests to investigate this, but we also want to avoid uh, unnecessary animal tests, which is why in the strategy and the guidance we propose to start with in vitro models to make sure that once we need to do need to do an animal test, it can be a, a dedicated test, or at least you have an hypothesis what you want to uh, in investigate further. But you can imagine that these are complex questions, and actually the data set was never designed to answer these type of questions, which is why both at EPSA and ECA we have two expert groups in place that can help the working groups uh, answer these difficult questions. Um, and these contain experts outside of the agencies with a background in the relevant, relevant fields. And so they can also help us in, in answering if there is a data gap, how can it best be addressed? Can it be addressed maybe by a non-test guideline method? Maybe we can tweak an existing method by including different parameters so we can answer the question. So we think this is helpful in getting uh, the, the, the answers without always necessarily asking for additional information. And if we can do so, maybe we can make sure that we write, ask for the right information. So what we have in place, we get the dossier, and usually we check whether all the information is present, whether we can say that it is safe to be, uh, to, to be used, and then it can be approved to be used on the market. But of course, when we get the implementation of the ED criteria, suddenly a lot of the assessments were put on hold because it simply did not contain sufficient information to come to a sound conclusion. So that's the situation at the moment. We have a dossier that is lying there. It doesn't contain sufficient information, so we need to be generated. And of course, what will be mentioned uh, uh, more often as well is that the waiting list at the moment at the CROs that need to generate this information. So this is causing big delays and is actually also from an aging point of view quite unfortunate. Of all the samples, all, all the substances that we have assessed so far, at least we, the following pattern emerges, and we see different patterns for human health and environment. I think when we look at human health, we see that from all that this is from over 120 substances that have been discussed uh, and concluded at the working groups, is that uh, about 10% of them are considered to be endocrine disruptors. And this is mostly for effects on the thyroid modality. Of about half of the substances, we have sufficient information to say this is most likely not an ED, uh, and then we can approve the substance, and then it's fine. And about a quarter of the substances there are no indications of ED, but there are some technical issues or other reasons for waiving further testing. Maybe it's a low hazard substance, or maybe it has a very reactive substance, and therefore it's difficult to maintain the right dose or the right concentration. So the situation for human health is quite okay. It's only about 5% or 10% of the substances we need to generate additional information. It's quite the opposite for the environment, where actually for about 5% of the substances we've concluded to be an endocrine disruptor, but actually about half of the substances. We need additional information to conclude on the ED properties because there's simply the information isn't, uh, isn't there. And again, this would require discussing what would be the best way to address the data gaps, but additional data needs to be, uh, needs to be generated. 
And that's a big difference between the human health and environment. I think when it comes to, from the agency point of view, is also the important thing is not only to support the member state in evaluation, but also to coordinate better the, the different substances that are assessed under the different regulations to make sure that if a substance A is, is uh, assessed under a uh, the, the certain regulation, that we can notify the member state saying, be aware that the same substance may be addressed on another regulation as well. So you talk to that member state, or maybe it's not the same substance, but a related substance for which the evidence can actually be applied in a way of evidence to make sure that it's safe or non-safe. And I think that's a challenge that we have, that we need to coordinate this much more quickly so that the member states can organize against each other to see if there's a data gap and how to address this so that we can uh, rest assured that already early on in the process, we tackle all the information to make sure that we have sufficient information to come to a sound conclusion, but also that conclusion can be carried over to all the different regulatory frameworks in a harmonized way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sander. I invite you to also um, take the seat up on stage for the, the later discussion. Um, so our next speaker is uh, representing the view of a member state authority and uh, I um, have great pleasure in um, welcoming Emily McVie, who is a senior ecotoxicologist. Is it just me, or is this session um, really overrepresented with ecotoxicologists? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's good. We're always saying there's too much mammalian toxicologists here, so finally the ecotoxicologists have their say. So Emily works at the um, Pesticides and Biocides Authority of the Netherlands, CTGB, um, and I hand over to you, Emily. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you so much to the organizers for asking me to be here. As was mentioned, I am a regulatory ecotoxicologist at a member state, the Netherlands, uh, the Competent Authority for Pesticides and Biocides. But actually, my background is human medicine and toxicology, so I'm sneakily both. <laughs> Um, and considering that, it should be no surprise to anyone that I spend most of my days at my desk really analyzing, evaluating the tests that we're talking about and about endocrine disruption. And I may be a little bit of a, a, a strange member state representative because I actually have been doing this for quite a long time. Even before there was a, a regulation in the EU, I was in the US and doing looking at these tests for the EDSP list one uh, substances. Um, and considering that, it, I think I'm qualified to say that right now, all of you in the audience and online are messing with my endocrine system. And that's because I'm used to being alone behind my desk, and now I'm standing up in front of all of you, and that's a stressful situation. Stress increases my heart rate, believe me, my blood pressure, alters my metabolism, my sleep cycles, and my immune system. So it's not good, right? Except when, I'm fleeing for my life, or fighting, or changing. So all organisms are hardwired to respond to these types of things. If we didn't, we would cease to exist. And, but when they go haywire, they can cause crazy things to happen. However, also, it's possible to alter the endocrine system to improve the ability of your offspring to survive. So an example of this is in frogs, and especially a good example, Xenopus, can control, I use this in quotes, their development to slow or increase the rate of development depending on external factors, such as food availability, such as pond drying. Um, I wonder if I'm, oh yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I will go to quickly. Here, a recent review by Paul et al., which reviews the crosstalk between the corticosteroid, or the stress signaling system, and the thyroid system that controls development in frogs. Um, and I hope with this example, and my example in myself, I've showed that there is a lot, this is a complex topic. The endocrine system is complex. It is a system because it's the communication system between the body, between the brain and the rest of the body, between the different organs of the body. Um, and so how do we actually determine whether we have actual endocrine disruption, where we have a direct effect on an endocrine pathway, or we have a response of the endocrine system to another toxicity, another stressor? Uh, and so, here we go, very nice. So what is the noise and what is the signal that we're looking for? Um, 
So when it comes to activity, what we currently have in the EU, and especially in ecotoxicology, sorry, talking about ecotoxicology again, is um, whole animal tests. And my background in medicine tells me that whole animal tests, if you're, sorry, Henrik, if you're looking for actual activity and pathways and mechanisms are really not good. And also my experience looking at these tests is this is really difficult to differentiate. Ideally, you want to have a very nice AOP, which we've seen earlier, thank you, Albert, and you can see it really initiating event, key events, adverse effect. But finding these initiating events and key events in the tests that we currently have is really difficult. Think of the Xenopus example in the fish short-term reproduction assay. Often it's done in, in um, periodic spawning fish. One of the main endpoints you're looking for is egg production per female, but it's really difficult to do that in periodic spawning fish because you have anyway periodicity. Um, recently, the US EPA, this has been mentioned, has made in vitro battery assays combined with its silicone networks. This is on the human health side. These will provide you with nice information about what is happening, what is a positive result. And on the uh, ecotox side, I think it's been briefly mentioned, we have Xenophis lithro embryo assay, which is a genetically modified embryo assay. This is also capable of giving you mechanistic information, activity information. Um, on the side of adversity, and this has already been mentioned, I think, um, we can detect lots of effects, but actually, uh, Linking those back to an endocrine activity, linking those back to what we want to see is really difficult. And Aldert has also mentioned the liver specifically. Of course, this is a main one. Uh, so in summary, the testing system we have is animal heavy. It can be confusing and it's a rather slow. Uh, robust screening for activity as described earlier would really assist us to reduce animal testing, animal use, improve detection, I believe, and increase our knowledge already. And I think Sander, I'll echo what he said. If you have this, you can also request appropriate animal tests, knowing what you want to see in your animal test. I would also emphasize knowing what your animal test can provide you, what are the endpoints that it can show. And besides tests, we have to keep building the knowledge. I'm really grateful to all of the poster presenters who are presenting their very nice uh, research to help us with building AOPs. We need harmonization. <laughs> as, uh, as Sander said, it can be easier said than done. And uh, I would just end by saying that toxicology is moving towards mechanisms of toxicology. I don't think we are going to be able to avoid that. I think what we need to, do, just as medicine has moved towards pathways to disease in the last 30 years, I think what we need to do now is look at how we can use the mechanistic toxicology tools better, improve the tools that we have available, increase our knowledge on the mechanisms, including the, the non-EATS mechanisms, and, uh, and, and, and concentrate on developing and validating those tools for the new dawn of mechanistic toxicology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. And please take your seat over here. Um, at, at the, um, well, you've got a choice of four chairs. So, right, um, I'm very pleased to welcome um, Ninja Reinecke, who is representing the view from an NGO perspective. And Ninja is head of science at the Chem Trust, um, where she's involved with uh, EU legislations on endocrine disruptors, persistent chemicals, but also works at the science policy interface. Ninja, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for inviting me to present the NGO view here today. Uh, I hope that uh, our online audience is also enjoying such a nice and warm environment as we have it here, uh, which is uh, also adding to the maybe a stressor or ex at least excitement, definitely. So, for a start, I would like you to focus your attention on the two pictures on the slide. This is our protection goal. This is what we have to keep in mind for the whole session. Whenever I speak to, to friends or family and, and try to explain what we're trying to do or what's the topic of the conference and, and what it's all about, they ask, hang on, you, you're doing all of these assessment and safety questions and evaluations why the substances are already on the market? This decrease of the TDI, BPA, we're still exposed and continue to be exposed at this moment. This is something 
people find hard to understand, and citizens expect that products are safe. They also expect that new scientific information about harm is transferred as much as possible and as quickly as possible into protective measures. And I think the fog expects that too. So what is working well? On the positive side, we have a commitment at the highest EU level in the EU chemical strategy that the exposure must be minimized. So that's good news for actually moving from science to policy. And it's also really important to acknowledge that the processes over established over the last couple of years for more ED assessment identifications with different expert groups and regulators, stakeholders and, um, discussing is also has set some procedures into place where we have these discussions. And also important new research projects are going on where we hope we will get more sensitive ED endpoints and test developments for that and also we get more relevant endpoints to predict effects for human health. So what needs improvement? We, we are not doing this as, a, as an academic exercise. At the beginning of the year, uh, sci scientists from the Resilience Center from Stockholm have said chemical pollution has passed the safe limit for humanity. So we really need to increase the focus on prevention and speed up the ED identification. A lot of the assessments currently ongoing in the ED expert group remain inconclusive because of the lack of data. So we also need to find a way of identifying those that are suspected to be EDs and also act on them, take them out from the consumer products, get them out from sensitive users and protect the environment. So accelerations of using like grouping, we need to get away from the single substance approach. We, we could never repeat these years of BPA assessment for all of the other bisphenols. And I think ECHA has done really important work on the grouping, which we also need to consider for further ED assessments on other groups. Overall, we also here at the one conference, and as we heard from Andreas Kortenkamm in the keynote lecture, we cannot talk about endocrine disruptors without considering the mixtures. So therefore, when we move forward, we need to fix the following and have these two boxes here for you. So we focus on the legislative changes first because the commission is currently putting the implement, uh, the uh, strategy for sustainable chemical stra sustainable strategy into practice and into the different pieces of legislation. So we are discussing new hazard classes for endocrine disruptors. So we need to have categories for endocrine disruptors that may be called confirmed endocrine disruptor, but we definitely need a category which is also for suspected EDs. So very similar to the current approach to the CMR substances. And then we need to make sure that these categories are also regulated across the different downstream legislations that we have in Europe, that these are applied in the different legislations. What we also heard and discussed more is that we need to close some of the knowledge gaps by adapting the data requirements in REACH but also in, in the other legislations. So when we look more at the ED assessment as such, here we need to identify really based on the scientific evidence, biological plausibility and conclude more quickly. I mean, we have many discussions I, I, I'm not allowed to give, go into details on some of the substances, but I can say that some of the kind of consensual discussions about how important uh, NAMs are and, and what we should look at and, and how important is it to degree uh, how we regulate, when it comes to the crux and people have to decide this is an ED and this would mean further regulation, the discussions become a bit uh, less agreeable and sometimes we also see the dispute popping up in court afterwards. So already now, there's a lot of challenges that regulators have to pass when they identify endocrine disruptors. I don't know, we had at least like three court cases just on, on, on the BPA for the different uh, identifications as SVHC. So our concern obviously is when we go forward, how do we make sure that we also not end up in a clogged system with more and more legal challenges of this kind? So that ha just has to go into the mix when we talk about increasing the use of all of these new approaches and methods. And then we heard already about the research going on and the need and, and some progress on 
using the data better that we currently have, taking the best information from the test methods that we do, but also integration of data from ED assessments for human health and the environment. The endocrine system has been conserved throughout evolution in the different species. So why do we often have to repeat all of the assessments <laughs> for human health and again for the environment or vice versa? But I think here we are really looking forward to some of the re new research that's ongoing, which we need to integrate into the regulatory assessments. Coming back to the family and the frog, my two keywords are faster prevention and faster protection. Thank you very much, Ninja. And um, our final presentation is actually a double act um, representing a view from uh, the European Commission. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Karin Nienstedt, who is from the DG uh, Health and Food Safety, and she leads the sector pesticides placing on the market in the unit pesticides and biocides. And our second expert is uh, Jordan Woodley, who is in the DG environment uh, within the unit responsible for safe and sustainable chemicals. I don't know who is going to start, but I'll leave that to you, and you still have seven minutes. Thank you. So thank you and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the invitation and the introduction. So we come in a double pack, so you get a mixed exposure <laughs> to the commission today. Um, the reason is that in the seven minutes we want to uh, tell you about some things, I mean progress which has happened during the last four or five years, which, uh, for which the different DGs are responsible and that's the reason we are coming in a double pack today. So, and we will build the presentation, let's say, in a chronolo chronological order and that's why I start first with uh, plant protection products and biocides. And uh, you may remember, many of you, that uh, some years ago we have been working a lot to be able to define scientific criteria to identify endocrine disruptors under these two legislations. Um, so they have been become applicable in 2018. Um, it's important to keep in mind that they are exactly the same for pesticides and biocides, and that was also part of the challenge um, to get them harmonized. Um, they are applicable to new and ongoing applications. And this was mentioned before, uh, partly also by Sandra, saying that for many dossiers you need new data and they are in a way blocked. And that is because it was a political decision at the time that the new criteria should be also applicable to ongoing applications. Usually it's applicable, I mean, new things which are introduced are applicable only to new dossiers. In this case, we decided to apply it also to ongoing applications, but of course then we need also to give the opportunity to the applicants to generate the data. And that's the reason many dossiers are still at uh, EFSA or ECHA level uh, to allow the applicant to provide the data. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, the rapporteur member states, EFSA, ECHA are applying these criteria to all the dossiers since 2018. Uh, what is very, very helpful is the joint guidance document from EFSA and ECHA, which was done uh, back in the time. It was also a huge effort to come up at the same time with the criteria, with, uh, with the guidance. Um, and it was also a decision from our side to ask the agencies to work together and uh, to ask our colleagues from JSC to, to be also involved in the work. We have also tried uh, to support member states to get used to the new criteria with a series of trainings under the Better Training for Safer Food program, uh, which was uh, the trainers were from EFSA and ECHA, and there were so far three trainings in 2019 and 2021. So the criteria are based on the internationally recognized WHO definition of an endocrine disruptor. There are three, basically, which all the three need to be fulfilled. So it needs to have an endocrine mode of action, it needs to have an adverse effect, and there need to be a causal link between the two. Um, you know that. And it was also mentioned before um, the need to look at known, uh, I mean, what is the link with, let's say, the, the, the CLP system. The criteria are defined in a way that they identify, um, let's say, substances 
with known and presumed uh, ED evidence, uh, so which would be equivalent to, if you compare it to a CMR system, to those which would be classified as uh, 1A or 1B. The criteria for plant protection products and biocide products don't, let's say, identify substances which would fall under category two. And with that, I give the floor to my colleague for the next part of the story. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, indeed, so now more to, toward the future and what uh, we will do, we are doing uh, at the Commission. Um, I think one of the main uh, action we have is the chemical uh, strategy for sustainability, in particular for endocrine disruptors, is really the introduction of new uh, hazard class for endocrine disruptors in the CLP regulation. It is, uh, like we say, the cornerstone of all the chemical legislation. Um, uh, in the development, in the current development of the, of the criteria, we use the, the definition of the WHO, but we also, of course, uh, build on the criteria already developed for pesticide and, uh, and biocide. Um, I say building on criteria because uh, this is not just possible to copy-paste uh, the, the criteria. One of the main reasons, for example, is uh, on the pesticide and biocide criteria, we have the differentiation with non-target organism, which we don't have as a concept in CLP, so we need, in any case, to adapt it. And we also need to, to adapt uh, the definition because, as you will see in the further slide, we will also propose to include suspected category uh, for endocrine disruptors, which is not part of the definition on pesticide and biocide. The idea for this uh, criteria is really to have horizontal criteria that can be uh, after applied across all legislation. And we also um, have a separation of, uh, of classes between uh, human health and the environment um, as uh, we, we, we see that in the current legislative framework, uh, in the downstream legislation, there is a distinction uh, between human health and environment, and so it, was, it is also more adequate to, to, to make the same separation in the, in the hazard class. Uh, and so for the general consideration of this hazard class, I think one of the main points is really to the introduction of categories. Uh, we, we use, uh, I think, the same model as for the CMR, uh, with the category one, where we will have the known or presumed endocrine disruptors, and we will have this uh, uh, category two for suspected endocrine disruptors. And so we will have these two categories for uh, each human health and also for the environment. And also part of this uh, new, um, new hazard class, we will also develop new label elements, in particular H statement uh, and uh, P statement for this, uh, for this new hazard class. Uh, and also, last uh, uh, also important work that we are doing is regarding REACH uh, regulation and the update of uh, ED information requirement in the REACH regulation. Uh, and so, uh, the objective is to, to update the REACH annexes to include a data requirement for endocrine disruptors. So, this is to modify uh, Annex 1 and Annex 7 to 10. Um, because for now, there is no specific ED test requirement in, in the REACH annexes. So, the idea is really to, to include new tests to to, to, have, uh, to ask the company to evaluate the, the ED properties of the substance. So this, we, this is based uh, on, uh, the, of course, the OECD conceptual framework for testing and assessment. It was developed. We also use uh, the update that was done under biocide regulation and uh, plant protection product annexes uh, with the inclusion of mandatory ED test. Um, but of course, we have to keep in mind that in the rich regulation, this is not like uh, in biocide or plant protection produ product where you have a full package of data. Here we have to take into account that in the rich legislation we have a, a tier approach. So this is not possible to, at a low tonnage bond, to already uh, require high uh, in vivo testing. And we really have to take into consideration this approach in order to, 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 to make our proposal. And so quickly about the, the timing that, uh, that we have. So uh, for the um, ED hazard classes, we will have uh, our first uh, commission proposal uh, in, in July, so in, in one month, and we will, um, we will have a first discussion in Caracal uh, in September, October, about this, uh, this uh, delegated act for the new hazard class. And also in autumn, we will also launch the co-decision uh, for CLP, which is another part uh, of the CLP revision. But so there is two, two, two proposals. And, uh, and on REACH, the timing is at the end of this year, uh, early uh, next year, that we will have the, the commission proposal ready for the revision of the REACH uh, regulation with the inclusion of new um, hazard, uh, of, of new uh, data requirement for, for ED. 
And so our take home message, but this is uh, just what we explain now. So we have already scientific ED criteria uh, for PPP and, and biocide that are already uh, applica uh, apply uh, since 2018, but we're now preparing for um, a new hazard uh, class for ED in the CLP, so an horizontal uh, hazard class, and we will also uh, update the, the rich indexes to include the data requirement on ED. Like this, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karin and Jordan, for this, uh, this very quick overview. And thank you for taking your seats on stage. And uh, this now gives me the opportunity to welcome our two session moderators also on stage while we are rebuilding the stage to allow them to join. Um, Andreas Kortenkam has already been introduced uh, earlier on, but I uh, have also great pleasure in welcoming Sharon Munn. Uh, as, as co-moderator, and Sharon is working for the European Commission's Joint Research Center mm -hmm. at ISPRA within the Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods Unit. Um, and Sharon has also been um, providing support in the development of the uh, guidance document, efsa ECA ed guidance document. So with that, I hand over to the two of you and um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, so, you also get a double pack of uh, co-moderators for this session with Andreas and myself, who will hopefully steer you through uh, a really stimulating discussion and interesting debate. Um, so, I'd like to thank the, uh, each of the, uh, the um, speakers for uh, a really um, very interesting, and I would say a wind spectrum of uh, views from different perspectives, which is exactly what we wanted, so uh, thank you for that as our starting point. We, the way we will uh, run this debate is that there w we will have four questions for each of you, and we want to each of you to have the opportunity to uh, give your views, so um, we need, you know, to sort of move everybody on uh, to get through each of the questions. And also for that reason, we don't anticipate that we would be able to take additional questions from, um, from the audience. Nevertheless, we would encourage everybody to put into the, uh, into the chat their comments because we may be able to uh, read, some of, read some of the comments out. And also to give uh, a feeling of, of audience involvement, um, we have decided to launch a poll for uh, two questions. So the audience are able to have some choice to choose what the first question will be out of two. So I think we're going to have um, it launched. Yes, what they... Um, Shall we step out of the picture? I, maybe we should. Oh, we yeah. have this. We have the word cloud, which is before the questions come, actually. But I can so see clearly two questions emerging there. <laughs> right, go ahead then, <laughs> Andreas. Really? Speeding up? Uh, yes. So this is, this is, we asked all of the uh, participants, the, the speakers, to give their, their final words. Oh, they've gone. I was just reading them out. Don't go. Please, come back. Um, and anyway, I wrote some of them down anyway. So uh, some of them was things like, um, we need um, faster. We need to be faster uh, to protect and prevent. We need to increase use of NAMs. Words like integration came up. Um, things like uh, invertebrates drive biodiversity. New dawn of mechanistic toxicology um, were some of the words that I had captured here and uh, were also captured in the word cloud, which we've now lost. But what's up there is a question. So you have the choice, audience. The first question is, how can NAMS be contextualized in the available regulatory frameworks for endocrine disruptors that are, as you know, been talking about, mainly hazard-based? And the question two, which additional modalities should be prioritized in terms of method development? And uh, we can see that so far, um, there's one clear winner uh, coming out. Uh, still chance for question two to catch up, if anybody's really keen on... Yeah, discussing a, different modalities. It's a more than two-thirds majority, I think. Uh, I think we have Shall it. we give you a few more moments for voting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, there's no movement. It's question one. Question one. So the winner is, it's like the Oscars here, isn't it? The winner <laughs> is question one. Yeah. Okay. And I have my money on that one. I just had a feeling that was going to yeah. be the one. Yeah. Okay. So that's the question that uh, we, you will now be requested to answer. So uh, how can NAMS be contextualized in the available regulatory frameworks uh, for endocrine disruptors? Um, Henry, I don't know why I'm looking at you. I don't know why, but I did my, my eyes are drawn to you. Would you like to start with this one? No, I would not like. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this is not an easy question. It's a complicated, uh, many-headed, <laughs> uh, or many roads to follow. But we have, uh, we uh, we all know the the criteria, and uh, of course, names um, are useful in in the uh, for the we look at the AOPs for the for the. For the mes and the and the and the key events, it's much easier than than for the adverse effects. Um, so I think they could they are going into into the the mechanistic part and and fortunately for us as ecotoxicologists, the, the embryo assays are also regarded as NAMs and there you could, in my opinion, uh, or we have mm -hmm. markers mm -hmm. of adversity in in some of them. Um, we need to agree that we are not. Going to the to the end of adversity, but but believe in uh, for for example with our fish assays that that non-inflation of a swim bladder is an adverse effect, and we can stop there, and it's still an AM. That would be one way to go co from mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. side. So maybe having another look at the way we see adversity is a, is a, a possibility. Seems like yeah. I don't know. I uh, maybe I look over to this side to see if anyone would like to come back on that. Maybe Emily? I don't, I don't know if come back on that. <laughs> or agree, <laughs> vehemently agree or disagree or add to. <laughs> no, no, I think add to because I think first yeah. you need to define what is a NAM. Like how are you defining your NAMs? Eh? I mentioned actually that if you have a really nice robust screening assay for what we call activity, but actually is two thirds of what of, of the regulation. Eh? You have to have uh, activity and a connection and adversity, but activity and the connection is two thirds of the <laughs> of the battle, let's say. Mm. You can also do a stepwise uh, uh, way of looking at it, where if you have these two thirds, you, well, do you need to go to the last third? I think this is actually in line with what you were saying. This is, mm. of course, an example of how you can contextualize it. And I do think that ecotoxicology is an area which is not mined enough for the NAMs, actually, because this is an area where the tests that we have are not technically categorized mm -hmm. as adversity tests anyway. And you do have these embryo assays, but you can also have development. And I'd like to mention, thank goodness, because I didn't in my talk, the Ergo project, looking at cross-species uh, crosstalk with the, with the different in vitro and in vivo assays, and, and that is really helpful. So I think mm -hmm. all of those developments can really assist us in, I guess, contextualizing uh, NAMs uh, to better implement them in the, what we have. But also, I mean, you really brought up the, this point of the mechanistic information and how important that is to actually identify any of these and how it's, in fact, easier, if you like, to, to do that in, in more with using NAMs. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Shall we ask uh, the industry? Shall we? Okay. Dan. Dan, interesting. So, so uh, yeah, speak and is it let we'll tell you if we can hear you. So, okay. I'll be honest, I was hoping for the other question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Invoke, but there, and I might sound a little bit kind of old-fashioned, but I've been a bit taken by surprise by this NAM discussion because I've always seen it as new approaches coming on. I didn't really see the need for a name for it, but as I understand it, we've got a variety of methods. And the, for me, the context of that would be the best way to contextualise it would be to go to the criteria. And Emily just alluded to that. Um, obviously, some of those methods are in silico, uh, methods which could be used for prioritization, read across. Um, we've got methods like seeker pass, which I think could be really useful. I presume that counts as a NAM. Um, I, I don't know. Um, phylogenetic comparisons, and, and that certainly provides an opportunity to, to do read across and maybe minimize animal testing, certainly to prioritize things. Um, but I think probably the biggest area of benefit for the, the, this process for NAMs would be in terms of AOPs, because 
we've got lots of in vitro assays and we can measure you know endocrine activity and to some degree we can establish what's adverse certainly in human health maybe a bit easier than in than in ecotoxicology um, but we do need to de demonstrate a linkage um, and there is you know the opportunity in the guidance to demonstrate that through a mode of action approach and the best way to do that in my view is take an AOP approach look at an AOP look at the data identify where you maybe don't have adequate information and you know make a hypothesis and propose that to an RMS uh, and do a test accordingly and I think that that's a better way as I mentioned hopefully at the end of the talk it's a better way to approach addressing the criteria than to do tick box exercise of tests which uh, and you know, obviously in the outset it might be good to just do a level three test and that might be sufficient to, to do the job and I think after that the danger is to say well if you've got something in a level three then you should go and do a fish for a life cycle which is ultimately just a bigger longer study which kills more fish it doesn't necessarily provide you with more mechanistic information that's going to fill in your AOP. And we need to fill in the AOP to demonstrate the biologically plausible linkage. So I, I think it's useful, and AOP networks will obviously help with that. Um, and so I've ended up hopefully sounding more positive than I started. But, um, yes, you did. I think it was <laughs> very uh, positive, surprise. actually. Um, can I also just <laughs> take the opportunity to say I forgot to put my two words up at the end of my flash presentation, uh, which were specificity and toolbox. Okay, thank you. Okay, may I just, uh, am I allowed to? You may allow yeah. uh, I think it's, a, it's a, a brilliant suggestion and we need to do something like this, um, linking, linking the question of endocrine mode of action with adversity utilizing AOPs and AOP networks. Is there a precedent for this already? Has this been tried? Can I step in there? Yeah, please. The, the so question I participated was directed in a uh, ECHA ED committee meeting on a well-known triazole. Uh, and you know, obviously this is my industry view, but it sounded to me a bit like members of the committee were voting on an AOP rather than on a mode of action for a compound. So I did point that out, because actually what, we were what was should have been up for discussion was whether the criteria were met by that substance. And the point in contention was whether there was a biologically plausible linkage. And I think that the key thing is to look at the data for that substance and see does it map to an AOP. Not say, mm -hmm. yeah, we think there's an AOP that links aromatase inhibition with fish reproduction. That's true. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the data for that substance align with that. Indeed, so I yes. think that's a precedent. I think, thank you, thank you. So um, shall we give someone else an opportunity, maybe Sander, would you like to come back on the... Uh, on the question, either building on what's been said or giving your own view. <laughs> Sander was there, okay. So. I can remember ten or twenty discussions. Um, no, but I think when it comes to because I think the question was uh, the, the, the uh, I can't see the question anymore. But the uh, the regulatory uh, how can we put contextualizing norms context? within yeah. the regulatory context? Yeah. And I think that the 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 it's like what all the other speakers say. I think it provides a lot of mechanistic information, which is important. I think I think if we would have much more information there, like Henrik was saying, you maybe you can even you can pinpoint where you should look further in your assessment and they have come up with a more intelligent strategy, uh, testing strategy. But of course, that means you, you, you would need to have information on that initiating events coming from all the NAM studies. And of course, if, the, if you're not required to do them, then probably nobody's going to do them. So I think the initial step is actually to require much more of those studies that are considered to be robust enough to be used as a screen because most of them, mm -hmm. you can easily screen them. Yeah. And I think when it comes to the bias size, the data requirements have been revised this year. And they now include the recommendation to use at the OCD test guidelines for in vitro methods to do those methods. So at least you start with a mechanistic information base to see whether you would need to investigate any, any further and you have some information. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's so many endocrine pathways still, still coming. So that I don't think it's feasible to put all of them into the data requirements, but um, uh, including at least some of them are the more prominent ones or the ones that we know that are predictive of something at first in the end, that if you can include those, and I think for the bias that we have this now, and I think when it comes to the more tier testing which you have on the reach, it is something you can do for m a lower volume chemicals because you, y it's quite easy to do some of the NAM studies. I mean, that's the whole point. You can do them quicker, yeah. you can do them faster, you can do them cheaper, and you don't need that much material, and you don't rely on the animals in most of them. So I think that's, that's how you could implement them quite easily into the regulation. And maybe later on you can use them as a, as a predictor of, of adversity, which means you might not need to do the animal test anymore.
I'm so That's glad you said yeah. that. I was <laughs> hoping you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Ninia, would you like to come in on that? Yes, thank you. Um, just building on, on the discussion here, I, I think what we also need to do is to ensure that the flexibility is there for the regulators, but also then for, for industry to use different approaches. And this is new non-animal methods, but it's also more use of read across for checking which chemical properties are actually the same within the group. Again, taking the group approach, which is already possible under CLP, but we might want to look if there are some of the legal text that could be formulated differently in the revision to allow and encourage even more of these uses and approaches than we currently do. And then I think taking some of the experience from the ECA EFSA ED guidance and, and bringing that also to the whole classification identification discussion under CLP will be crucial as well. And here, of course, the tricky point will be to differentiate what is the level needed for a category one identification and what is then what are the methods that you need for satisfying a category two identification. Because this will be the regulatory categories that then count for, for all of the downstream application. That's a very good point. Sorry to throw yeah. this in, but uh, what about the thorny issue of international validation? <laughs> well, maybe Emily, she's got a finger up. Of NAMS, but, uh, before we... <laughs> Wait, but that was this morning's session. <laughs> 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 uh, I actually just did want to come back to your question about AOPs and if there's some proof or if this has been done, and I think we have indeed seen this. Um, I think there are th the problems that we run into are the valability of any methods, NOMs, endpoints, etc., to show the different key events to be able to make that linkage. And that's one of the reasons why I was sort of promoting the Ergo project for reading across. Also, even if you have them, you may only have them for human health. Maybe you have them for vertebrates. You definitely don't have them for invertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the, that the point is that more development of the norms and also much more pinpointed into the, the regulatory need and looking at what is in the AOP, how can we measure this, what is in the AOP, how is pre measures develop an AOP, also develop a way to look at the key events or which endpoints should be measured in the in vivo studies, eh? because that's also possible. We have many in vivo studies where sort of the endpoints that we need have not been measured. And then Andreas's point about the um, reliability and the relevance that you demonstrate through validation? Yeah, well, and I think that that, um, that is a sticky issue, maybe, because we do have certain criteria that we use for reliability and relevance, but when mm. it comes to looking at key events and these types of things, mm, we cannot be as rigorous because we don't; those are not validated assays, and we already have to use them, mm. actually. If you're trying to look at those, and you are they are not validated, fact, and we still have to be able to look at them. I mean, I hope that we as experienced evaluators can look at the, at the key details that we need to look at, but of course it's not an internationally validated uh, mm. asset. Mm. Thank two you. Minutes two minutes for Dex's question yeah. to find out in here. Oh, there's one for Sandra, but um, I do feel like we need to let yeah. uh, Jordan and Karen. Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, I, I would like to put this um, the question we have also in perspective with the regulation need and what we try to achieve because we talk about NAMS as if we are able to, uh, as a regulator, from a regulatory point of view, to make an assessment and to, to take a decision on uh, how to regulate the risk, if there is a risk. But um, when we talk about, when we go uh, with the CLP regulation to a new hazard class, this is also about uh, self-classification. So this is also uh, for the company to be able, based on NAMS, to make the self-classification on their side and be able to take a decision on the risk management because first this is on the side of industry to, to regulate the risk, to take measure for the mm -hmm. risk, and they need to have the test to make an assessment, their own assessment. And it's also a concept, of course, we have, the, we have after the CLP harmonized classification dossier, but this is the second step. The first, this is really self-classification, and we need to have uh, tests that are uh, robust for industry to make a, a decision at it. And this is important to take into consideration when we try to put NAMS in perspective in some, uh, some regulation yeah. to for yeah, as a yeah. program. Yes, then you probably may need this validated uh, test method in the regulation, in the guideline. But Karin, please. Yeah, if I may add, does it, is it working? You are working. Yeah, okay. Is it working? Um, <coughs> Sounds quiet. She's though. working. Please, go ahead. The it's microphone. Working. Yeah. Um, of course, scientific developments are good, and we should really try to incorporate them in a regulatory system as fast as we can, if it makes sense. 
Um, if it comes to experimental methods, uh, a validation is important, uh, ring testing, uh, in order to ensure that they are robust and the results are, are comparable. So we are monitoring, monitoring these and uh, well, updating data requirements when it comes, uh, when, when, it, when it's due time, when there is a need. Um, just in the area of plant protection products, I would like to mention that all scientific literature is considered in the dossiers, so also non-GLP studies, that's something to be kept in mind, and also that there is now the, the pre-submission meetings for applications are really a, a, a possibility, uh, becoming more and more important, and that there, there is really a window of opportunity for the applicants and the rapporteur member states to discuss these issues, and if there are ad hoc methods which may be useful, I mean, it could be discussed in these pre-submission meetings yeah. and put in context. Mm. Yes, which would be, would be great if that actually occurred. I think we have to move on maybe to the next yes. question. There yeah. is something here, but it's uh, related to one substance, one assessment, which I think we'll come back to later. Actually. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah okay. we have to. So it's time to move to the next question, yes. uh, which I will uh, read out for you. Does the panel think that a similar level of knowledge and understanding regarding ED properties will ever be achieved for non-target organisms compared to humans. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Dan, please. Dan. Yeah, I think the obvious answer is no. <laughs> there's lots of them. Th there's lots of them. Uh, they include invertebrates and lots of different invertebrates. And I think the more important question is, do we need an equivalent level of information about those. Um, and you could argue maybe not. We can take um, an approach of looking for key groups, you know, important species which maybe are involved at community level, try and understand better about that, get an understanding of how many different species are represented by that. This obviously, obviously kind of feeds into the, what the area we've just been talking about with um, phylogenetic analysis, new approach methodologies. I think, however, the real issue with, with this in terms of invert, ultimately you're asking about ED and invertebrates, is establishing adversity. Um, you know, we, c we could spend a lot of time worrying about what the mechanisms are, might be that by something could, by which something could interact with an invertebrate. Unless we've got a very good idea how we establish adversity, it doesn't really matter because we're not really left able to establish whether we've met all parts of the criteria. So I think you could spend lots of time researching lots of different species to understand different hormones, but ultimately the, the regulation will be fairly impotent if we don't have a good understanding of what means what adversity means at a population level for invertebrates like NTAs. So the uh, adversity for, for these organisms would have to be judged as danger to the population, so to population decline. That's a well fairly tall order. Yeah. In, in risk assessment, yeah. the protection goals yeah. are at population level. And yeah. I would assume yeah. that even though this is you know, a hazard characterization, certainly the guidance on negligible exposure mm. sort of piggybacks that argument on the protection goals. And I would assume that the same thing would happen here. Yeah. Any views from? Uh, Henrik? Maybe Henrik wants to come. Henrik. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my answer is also no. <laughs> uh, just look at um, the funding funding picture in the uh, in Europe. Uh, what goes to health and mammalian research and what goes to non-mammalian research? Then you have the answer already. Um, is that okay? I agree with Dan. We don't need the same level of information. We, it's impossible for all species. So classing would be uh, would probably be a good idea. But still, we have huge gaps. Now we talk about invertebrates. It's not only for invertebrates. We still have huge gaps for non-EAS uh, teeth. Mm. But for invertebrates, they are mm. invertebrates, they are even larger. And uh, mm. we have examples, TBT and snails. Uh, they can be sensitive. They can be mm. extinct if you don't do something. Uh, so, and I don't think you would catch TBT in any of the <laughs> existing guidelines we have today. So yeah. we need to improve. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a very, very good, good point. point. And, yeah. and we don't need to get at the level, also because we talk about populations and we talk about individuals for human health. But, but, but we need may to I 
May I, just for clarification, I th I'm interested in your view, uh, Henrik, but, but also others. If, if we are saying population level effects, does that not increase the burden of proof, the hurdle, even further? It depends if you put it on the industry to prove it's not population <laughs> relevant <laughs> or if you need to prove it's population relevant. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a, a difference. But uh, actually it is more or less defined, the, the population relevance, growth, reproduction, and so, so if you go for that defined part, it is stated what is adversity at okay. the population level. Thank you for that, Henrik. Any views from, please. Maybe it's just the choir, but I would also say no, and I would say we don't have it outside of endocrine disruption, so why would we have it uh, within endocrine disruption? We were talking about telos and non-telos fish of the <laughs> tens of thousands of fish species. We only test one small part of them. Um, but I think the truth is we do have some knowledge on, on, on the endocrine systems in, in, in invertebrates, of course, because we have insect growth regulators and we have plant growth regulators, and those are... <laughs> literally using the endocrine system of insects and plants. Um, that exists, and I think the good question is, at, at what point do we want to regulate this? What do we count as being in adversity? And, and, and indeed, how much energy and time do we, do we use for this? I have a colleague who's an expert in endocrine disruption in invertebrates because she was coming at it from a plant-insect relationship and, a, and an efficacy point of view, actually. So those are sort of big questions and big regulatory questions that maybe we would need to answer before we go further with, with, with many other species. But I do think we have nice projects available looking at, at, at um, yeah, at read across actually and, and grouping, which we've just talked about. So th that can definitely help. Thank you. Linia, please. Yeah, just uh, to add on this very good point, which I also wanted to make, um, to I think we need to separate a bit more what level of knowledge we need for the academic discussions and generating more knowledge. Uh, I'm a scientist, I'm always interested in more data and more details, and we will always have open questions and knowledge gaps, but this cannot be the requirement for regulatory decisions. And, and sometimes I think we are still too much looking for this perfect knowledge be before we actually take a decision and say, yeah, well, actually, it is a harmful chemical, we, we need to do something about it. Yeah, maybe to, to, to complement of, of what uh, Minya said. Um, uh, coming from the more rich part, we don't have this concept of non-target organisms. So when we talk about uh, endocrine disruptors in the environment, we, we don't need to, to check in all the, all the species if this is a, a needy or not. This is really if we find in one of the uh, species that this is a needy, this, this should be sufficient to classify. And we don't need to check. So this come back to there is academia that need to understand and to, to have a comprehension of what is an ED for all species, but from a regulatory perspective, we have to prioritize on what we really need to take a decision on, on the hazardous substances. And I think uh, in some cases, we, we don't need to test in all species. Uh, we can, if we have uh, just one species which, is, which shows that this is an ED, uh, this should be sufficient to, to classify uh, as an ED. Thank you. Uh, Karin, would you like to add or? You don't have to if you don't want to. No, no, that's oh, okay. okay. Uh, I want to. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, the question is, um, would we ever know, let's say, the same, have the same level of understanding for um, non-target organisms or environmental, let's say, other species compared to humans? And I, I share the view of other speakers that well, as society, we have just more data about humans, and by nature, we may be more interested in humans. I mean, even if we are a lot of ecotoxicologists here, um, well, we are focusing on our species. Um, that's the bad news, I think. The good news is that it is possible to extrapolate also a lot, and that there is research going on. So um, that's, that's the good news of the story. Thank you. Yeah. Also, maybe the word integration as well, and the cross-extrapolation, and the... Yeah, bringing together and maybe things are changing. Yeah, but sorry, it, there's three gentlemen here and they all want to say something. Uh, two of them said no. something already. Sandra, yeah, so would it you? Must be Sandra's <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I want to say it now. I didn't want to no, say okay. yes. Um, uh, I, I think what what is the important thing here is that we I, I fully agree with both Henrik but also with Dan saying we we don't maybe need this high level of information, but I think what the ED, uh, what the whole industrial disruption scene does bring us to the table is that 
now by screening all these initiating events and trying to understand the modes of action much better, is actually that we, it, it would allow you to, with models also like the sequapods, for example, where you look at protein sequences, to, to think about the models that we have been using so long for the environment. Because, of course, for pragmatic reasons, we haven't been investigating all the species that we know. We mm -hmm. have some, some taxa that were representing uh, certain levels of, of the ecosystem. But now, maybe with the mechanistic information that we get through those screening uh, methods that we have, it might allow you to identify actually what would be expected to be the more sensitive species or the more sensitive life stage, which might not be incorporated into the test pipeline that we, uh, that we have. So it's not that we want to protect all the species out there, but I think, do think it might allow us to be more intelligent about which species do we actually want to investigate where it becomes population relevant rather than just relying on the standard species that we have. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I think we have some Emily, time. Okay. Would you like to say, I, I saw your hand yes, movement yes, there. Yes, I just I wanted to come back yeah. on the question of, of who to uh, what species to test and who is sensitive. Because yes, I think let's have a heated <laughs> debate. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, because I actually think what is maybe very difficult is that actually if you see when you test many more different species, and I'm going to go outside of ED and use an example of bioaccumulation, if you test many different species, there was a recent paper from Pim Lossenar from the RVM, he looked at bioaccumulation testing in many different species of fish, and what he showed is that uh, you end up getting a huge variety of answers from under the trigger to over the trigger, which is exactly what you possibly might expect. And so sometimes if you say, oh, we will test <laughs> in more different species, you just create a bigger regulatory boondoggle for yourself and have to go a lot further into looking at what you are doing and why you're using your trigger values. So just to add, uh, yes, it would be great if we knew what were the most sensitive species. Most of the time the tests were developed also in human health because those animals could be raised in the lab and were easy to raise. <laughs> Karen. Maybe to add, and maybe the most sensitive species depends on the, on the substance. Uh, so it's not always the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, there is a question there for Sandra, not directly um, related to the topic we are debating, but I want to give the audience a bit of a, a bit of space. Uh, so, Sandra, if I read this out, the question is from Aaron O'Sullivan: What are the challenges for one substance, one assessment across EFSA and ECHA when they, uh, uh, when these agencies have different goals, namely food safety risk assessments versus chemical hazard? Classification hazard and risks are different paradigms. Are they paradigms, but they are different? Sandra? Well, they're different for sure, but I think when it comes to the hazard identification part, I think that's uh, exactly the part that you can harmonize. The, the, the th we can agree on yeah. whether the hazard is actually there or not. Whether that means you should approve that substance, that can depend on the, on the context. Uh, maybe, maybe it's an essential use and therefore you should allow its use as a biocide, but it's non-essential as a pesticide and therefore you shouldn't. So that, that, is then depend, that, that depends whether you can approve it. But I think we should be able to agree on the hazard identification part because that would mean we interpret all the data that we have from animal studies, from mechanistic studies, all in the same way and agree on the answer. I think the most challenging part is the agencies is actually also making sure that we, we're all assessing the same data set itself because we have applicants under pesticides that have a different data package than another applicant under the biocides even though it's a different substance. And at the moment, we don't have access automatically to each other's data set. Mm. And I think when it comes to biocidal products, it's even worse because we are under the biocides. We're also, uh, we have to assess the product itself, which means a lot of the non-active substances are coming from the REACH regulation. And yeah. we don't automatically have access to all the data. So I think yeah. the most challenging part for agencies is being able to share and access each other's data to make sure that we're all accessing the same bigger data package rather than a limited set. Thank you, Sandra, for a crisp answer. Um, shall we, Sharon, move on to the next question, which is yours? It is indeed. But I don't know, we've still got a little bit of time if you wanted to make your final point yeah, on this question. And then we'll yeah, to yeah, all right. <laughs> No, just shortly. Oh. But shortly, uh, yeah. you've got one minute, It'll fifteen seconds. Less than one minute. Just yeah, yeah. I go back to invertebrates. I work with fish every day, so I would like to talk about invertebrates. And I fully agree with Emily and Annie that we actually know a lot about the invertebrate endocrine system, especially from industry and development of uh, different types of uh, substances. But the prop and we don't. We would like as academic to know a lot more. But I agree, it's not needed. But we don't have any test guidelines close to covering any of these known endocrine mm. effects. And the excuse in the guidance document, not in co covering at all invertebrates, is that we don't know enough about the endocrine system. And then it's more or less taken out. So I still think 
there is room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Henrik. And Dan, you have the last word. Yeah, no, just, um, yeah, it's on the, I think I just wanted to maybe a note of caution, because we had a discussion just now talking, and it seems to drift into sensitive species. But we're kind of talking about hazard characterization here, not risk assessment. So I would have thought for invertebrates, what we should be looking at is kind of specificity and what we know about their endocrine systems and whether they, it could be disrupted. And actually, the sensitivities, you know, according to the legislation, not that important because we can, you know, we don't have a lead effect. We can have a very weak uh, hormone agonist, which might only be taking effect above or around the MTC, but that's still an endocrine disrupt. There's still endocrine activity, and it could still lead to a classification as an ED. So sensitivity is not that not that important per se. So I think when we start exploring into invertebrates, we should not get bogged down in which is the most sensitive species. Oh, OK. Th thank you, Dan. And I'll hand okay, over I to Sharon. The question. OK, so the third question, um, when I find it, is, uh, ah, yes, here it is. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, um, it's related to what the biocides and pesticides regulations. Uh, the criteria have triggered many initiatives. Uh, which led to EU projects, EU projects like Urion and uh, other projects focusing on developing new methods for ED identification. But um, maybe the pace of um, innovation does not match the pace of its implementation. So uh, would you agree with that? Uh, and then the real question is, can we design a process that allows us to speed up? What can we do to speed up? the regulatory implementation and application of innovative approaches. So it's sort of a question in two parts. First, you agree the pace of innovation does not match the pace of implementation, and then how to speed up. Um, do you start on this side? Anyone? Anyone wants to volunteer as a burning wish to... Karen. Karen. Yes, yes. I mentioned it a little bit before already, yeah. some of the keywords. Um, in a way, it's normal that, let's say, innovation and science, until it's transposed in regulation, takes a little bit of time. Uh, that's absolutely normal. Um, but OK, here we are trying to speed it up. So and uh, as I mentioned before, for pesticides, first, all literature needs to be considered. So there, there is, let's say, an open window to use also innova innovative protocols and results in the assessments. Of course, it will then be assessed if it's relevant, et cetera, or not, but it should be considered. And then the issue that um, ad hoc protocols can also be considered in a dossier, but of course, I mean, they are not peer reviewed. They have not been assigned. Uh, they're, not, they're not recognized. They're not in the data requirements, but you could still submit a study done on the basis of an ad hoc protocol. And here, back to the pre-submission meetings, is super important. If there is the need or there is innovation, I mean, it can be discussed and it can be considered. And that's a way of speeding up also these new developments in science into the regulatory um, system. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, and Emily, do you want to take it uh, further? Just to add, I yeah. think that actually the ED regulation is relatively flexible for that because you do have the AOP, you do have the linking between, and then you really have to use some, well, not yet internationally validated assays in order to do that. And also some endpoints from validated tests which may not have been part of the validation. So I think actually for EDs, it may be even more flexible than outside of EDs. <laughs> um, so just to add that to you. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think um, Nina, Nina, please, yeah, want to take it. Thank you. Um, I mean, when we're looking at the uh, current obstacles, no. that's basically the other way how to see uh, why actually do we need to speed it up? So what, what is currently holding it up? And I, I think, for example, under REACH, um, the ED identification is coupled with the need to demonstrate equivalent level of concern. Um, which always is an additional burden when you as a regulator propose a substance as an SVHC and then go for the ED identification. And um, I mean, there's a famous uh, case in point on resorts, you know, which has just been hanging in procedures now for <laughs> quite a while. Um, and I think there are other examples as well. So in terms of 
one solution is in the REACH revision. We need to have a separate entry on just endocrine disrupting property in the uh, Article 57 and not this need to demonstrate equivalent level of concern. That there would be very specific proposal to delete these mm. two properties. Uh, Jordan, I think it's appropriate you come back on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is um, yeah to to add, but also also to again to we we talk about a lot of pesticide by your side, but I think for for reach this is really uh, different what we have as as an approach because we we need to to give clarity to to the company on which steps they need to do uh, to to fulfill their obligation of registration at first. No, we don't talk about even uh, identification of DDA. We talk really about registration, and um, we need to have kind of validated test guideline and also a capacity, laboratory capacity to make this test. So we can have uh, some ad hoc uh, test available, but if you don't have the capacity in laboratory to make the test, we cannot just put it in, in the reach and exist to ask the company to do it because they will not be able to, to comply with it. So this is also another thing to take into account, how to increase the capacity in the new test guidelines that are validated to OECD uh, to, to be able to put this, this test uh, uh, in, the, in the reach and exist. And as part of the, the, the reach revision uh, and uh, how we evaluate uh, which uh, ED test to put inside the reach and exist, we are doing this work. So uh, checking about the laboratory capacity, to really see if this is possible or not to put this test, or if we know that in one, two years, we will have the capacity or not to have this test. I can't stop myself from just reading out to you this refreshing intervention by uh, Lisa Baumann. She says, how to speed up implementation of science into regulation? Clear answer, provide more funding for validation studies. We at the universities cannot provide the data needed without additional funding. Unfortunately, validation is boring. From an academic point of view, we researchers rely on publications that are novel and not a repetition of things that were already done before. Well, yes. <laughs> probably you, maybe a lot of people in the room agree with that. And I think, you know, we are making, trying to make some steps to get more uh, funding for validation into these activities. But I think I have to turn to this side of the room because uh, I'll give you an opportunity to, uh, to give your views, some speeding up and some good ideas of how to do it. So who would like to go first? Henry? Yeah, now I'm in the same project as Lisa, so of course I support her, her yeah. statement <laughs> here. No, and, th and that is, I think that's one side of, of the story because, yeah, you can't hire a PhD to do repeat work already done. So a different type of support for, for validation is important. But the other side of this is that the regulators actually should use what we put in the toolbox 10 years ago also because we have a lot for at least EA and S in the toolbox, but if you look into yeah, REACH, now it's coming, but yeah. it's been there for 10 years, many of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know as from academia how to speed up the change of the standard information requirements. Uh, I see it now, it's coming mm. in several regulations, but mm. yeah. yeah. We'll try to speed up validation, yeah. and then you should speed up. It's <laughs> just a, uh, maybe um, some of you might like to comment on this. It's just a perception from me. Uh, as far as I can see, please correct me if I'm wrong, and I hope I'm wrong. Uh, the main uh, impediment to uh, quicker implementation is, is the validation hurdle. Or n some, someone here disputed this. Uh, there's flexibility, I heard, but I don't think that there is much. Uh, what is the situation, Dan? Not to address that directly, but I mean, oh I think as a, as a notifier, I think I, certainly as an individual scientist in working in industry, I don't believe that validation is as good as it used to be. I think that validation is under a lot of pressure because of the sort of conversations that are going on here. And I think that validation is not as robust as it used to be. And there's, you know, I can he hear you know, a, a chatter of we need it to be faster and we need these methodologies and we need them to be validated. Well, you know, as someone that uses the studies, I feel at times that we've just about got used to and just about got someone that can reliably deliver a study and we're being told that that's not the right one, we should be doing something else. And yeah. we've got another methodology which is less well validated and less reliable and, and that's not a good situation. So actually, you know, I'm not saying that everything needs to stay the same, but actually, we, we do need a, le a certain degree of stability in order to get, because validation is only the first part of the process. Once you've got a validated study, all the validation does is show that, and then certainly in this context, 
is that an endocrine active compound of a certain modality does what you expect mm. in an organism which you know can respond to it. But that, that doesn't actually tell you very much about whether you can use that methodology to, to assess compounds for the activity. What you need is a training set. What you need is, a, a, is experience of putting unknowns through it because the responses you get from unknowns are usually quite different from what you get from your negative control compound. Yeah. And when you look at, and you know, if you look at the EDSP data from the AMA study, you've got an enormous range of uh, enormous variation in something simple like hind limb length when you look at day seven, day 21, there's a massive cloud, which is the morphogenic space. And what, what you quite often see is people forgetting about that and saying, statistically, this treatment is different from that treatment. Well, if you put them in the context of the cloud, it's meaningless. And you only get that cloud when you've done some studies. So if we're constantly on a sort of roller coaster where we get another, another method, it, it's going to be hard to get reliable data and you'll get increasingly kind of frustrated notifiers. I think your point is well taken, Dan, and I don't think anyone advocates um, um, a lax validation uh, procedure. Here's a, another interesting intervention from Francois Busquet. Can Emily come back on that? Just is it just this? Yeah, is it on I the think same let me allow it's on the same <laughs> subject. Why not skip OECD t test guideline hardcore processes and focus on implementing NAMs within EU test method regulation to be more flexible? That's another interesting thought. Emily? And, I, and I actually, that it's very nice that was kind of in line with what I was saying because mm. I maybe I am on the opposite side, uh, agreeing with Dan, but also on the opposite side because I, I tend to agree that the validation, the way we do it now, is we test known substances and then we say, here's a very nice pattern. If you see this pattern, this is an ED or this is activity on whatever axis. But then what you actually see when you test a bunch of unknown substances is any number of different patterns, which you have to deci then decide, okay, is that within the pattern I'm supposed to see or is it outside of it? This is talking about whole animal tests, by the way, getting back to my talk. Um, but I think actually that, that, that the real test for the tests is when we use them in regulation. So maybe instead of saying, oh, no, we can't do it if we do it willy-nilly, I don't advocate just taking any test, but I think the way that we really validate and we really get mm. to trust and we really know about them is actually by daring to use them, so. Yeah. It speaks to the importance of validation, but also post-validation, in fact, as well. Karen. Karen. There is another important aspect of validation, and that's that we need to be sure from a regulator perspective that if a test has been applied in different laboratories, you get the same results. So that's the ring testing because, of course, if you have only one lab who has, I don't know, does the, the, the study in a certain way and then you repeat it in another location and you get different results, then it's not repeatable and it's not robust. So that's one aspect of validation also which needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. sure. We need to be sure that the results which come out are comparable and are robust and uh, there is a, there's a repeatability. Yeah. So I'm really he hearing that. Validation is actually important. Uh, it might be slow, but maybe that's the nature of it. And but then, you know, if you, the more resource put in, the quicker you can always be. It can often be a, a resource issue. But uh, Sandra has not spoken yet, has she? No, but I also wanted to highlight that. I mean, validation is important, definitely, and and I fully agree. It's 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 a very boring and long-term process. You really need many, many, many years. And uh, unfortunately, I know exactly how that is. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the validation, it, it's used as a very wide term, but it doesn't always mean that the validation would include that you actually predict a certain a certain uh, effect biologically, but also you need to see it in a, like an AOP kind of context. You can validate a new test if it reliably measures a certain key event, it's saying you don't need to go through the entire process, but you need to show that whatever you measure, that laboratory A measures it and laboratory B measures it, at least you agree on the, on the outcome. And I think this can be done quite quickly. It can probably be done outside of the OECD context, but you need still a data set to show that whatever you're measuring and putting into a regulatory dossier for a decision has been reliably assessed. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can use a whole AOP kind of framework to see, okay, if this key event is reliably measured, then what does that mean for the outcome? But I think that you can do in a, in a relatively easy way. And as Emily said, sometimes we can decide on some ad hoc 
uh, protocol that you can use, which mm. is maybe not done through all uh, OCD validation, but does, al uh, it, it does depend on the mechanisms and the information you have gained from other data sets. Mm. So make sure that you're actually answering the right question. Mm. And that sort of was uh, also the, uh, a, a question on whether the OCD, if you add another endpoint, is it then still a test guideline? Probably not. But I think we, we have the flexibility to say, okay, from other reasons, we know that this should be a good point, and even without going through the validation, we might be able to, to, to add it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last qu uh, comment on this, I think. Well, if that's okay, negative, then we'll move positive. on to the next question. Negative, uh, on the flip side of what we were discussing before, when you do get a well-validated test guideline, for example, FISH 230 assay, which went through pretty extensive validation, it's then frustrating as a notifier when you get comments that a particular endpoint in that assay isn't regarded as reliable or informative on the mode of action you're talking about because you've done the study according to the guideline which you've done, which you've validated and agreed to be responsive to that mode of action. So that I think is not really acceptable. Um, and I think that I'm not saying that's universal, but some member states are sort of make that kind of comment and I think it's it's not helpful. On a more positive note, I mentioned the H295R assay earlier as being having very high positive. That's undergoing revision mm. at the moment. Yeah. Um, and certainly in CLE we were very happy to see that's happening and, and it's a really good positive thing to see that post validation activities do happen as you mentioned. Yeah. Okay, that's a good note to end on I think then uh we can yes, move on to uh, the, the, the last, question. the final yeah. question. So the context of this is the um, one substance, one assessment philosophy and the zero pollution environment ambition spelled out by the European Commission. The question to the panel is as follows. Is the current approach used for pesticides and biocides considered fit for purpose for its implementation in other EU regulatory jurisdictions? So beyond pesticides, biocides. Any views on that? Any volunteer? Dan. I think in principle it can be applied, but I think that there's just, if, if you go to reach and look at low tonnage compounds, then there's not going to be the data available. And if you've got a fairly restrictive um, assessment process which has data adequacy, requirements, not data requirements, I hasten to add, but data adequacy requirements, then an awful lot of things are going to come up with not much there. So, I, I mean, I think the only way to around that is to try and instill some sen some element of prop proportionality in it where there's, you know, triggers for certain certain levels of testing as you go through tonnage bands, because otherwise I it's going to be very difficult to see how you could uh, get the same level of data for something I I in low tonnage bands. It's just not going to be there. And we've discussed the CRO you know, queue uh, as being a consequence of that. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, any other views? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so Dan and then Ninja. Okay. Yeah, yeah um, I think um, this was really the, the right point to, to talk about reach and the low tonnage because we can, we this is not foreseen in the reach regulation to, to ask a full data set for low tonnage substance. Uh, because of proportionality, because and this is based on, on the tonnage. So um, I don't think this is really fit for purpose to, uh, and to use what is asked in biocide and to just ask the it for all the, the rich substance. Um, uh, but we, we have in, in rich uh, regulation another mechanism regarding substance evaluation, which uh, allow, uh, based on the data set we have, to uh, ask more tests depending of the concern we have and if this is relevant. And, and, we and when we go to this direction, we can I think be close to the approach of on uh, um, pesticide and biocide to have the data set we need and uh, to, to make the decision. And for this year, we are more close to this. But at the registration stage, no, this is not at all foreseen in the rich regulation to just have the full data set uh, and to ask all companies when they import uh, one ton of substance just to do uh, in, in vivo tier 5 uh, test. And this is not just not foreseen for now. Merci. Ninja. Yeah, from I mean, from my perspective, um, the, the current criteria for pesticide and biocides just require a way too high burden of proof, even for pesticides and biocides identification, because we only have identified a handful of substances in these cases over the last years, because there's 
always the discussion of, is it really adverse? Mm, maybe not. Or is it or is it the mode of action? Or is it a plausible link? Do we don't we need to demonstrate more? So we have many pending assessments, even for pesticides and biocides. So therefore, I think that would be my first consideration to say, how do we actually get out of that? Because we, if we wait for validation for new things, it will take years. If we wait for other studies, it takes more years. I think we just need a different discussion on how these criteria for EVs can be met better so that we have the protection goal in mind. Because again, it's not about the academic questions, it's about the protection. And then secondly, I think as the information gap is even worse for industrial chemicals, as we heard, um, the category two for the suspected endocrine disruptors under CLP will have to play a really crucial role um, where we already identify suspected endocrine disruptors but take it then forward as like a protection level to cut off these criteria, uh, these uh, substances also in all of the sensitive uses for environment and health. So these are the two approaches which I think we have to take. Thank you for that. Uh, just a quick interjection uh, point for all panelists. What in and directly to you, and before I go to Karen, um, what, according to ob your observations, is the bottleneck? Is it the mode of action? Is it the adversity? Or is it proving the link between the two? I mean, others can add as well. Mm, I think it's it's actually in many cases it's both currently or it's, it's also or yeah, it's both it's basically adversity or a mode of action yeah. okay thank you Karen yeah I would like to relativize a little bit what you just said because you need to keep in mind that the criteria were applicable in November 2018 so we have not yet four years from the date where the, the criteria became applicable the normal time for a dossier in the PPP regulation between the submission of the dossier to a rapporteur member state and the, the EFSA conclusion is three years. That's the normal time and member states are normally a little bit late and I, I mean it's, it's inherently in the system that these three years are not always be, let's say, fulfilled. So if you look at this, we have not yet done one, I mean, for few substances, we have the three years done, we have the three years and a half. So I would not be so negative with the progress which we have done. I mean, I am looking at the figures I took note before. I mean, by end of 2021, there were 25 plant protection product active substances fully evaluated under the new EB criteria. So in the three years, uh, and I'm talking on the control of EFSA, and there are 50 which are currently being assessed under stop the clock, and that's not, not bad at all. So we just need to also give a little bit time to the system to, let's say, make our normal regulatory cycle. And I mean, it's, it's like it is. I mean, the, the rapporteur member state needs to look at it, then there is a peer review, there is a consultation step. All these are periods of time which sum up, and the, let's say, if you really are, are good in, in deadlines, I mean, it's three years minimum. So, and we are, we are really three and a half years from the applicability of the criteria. So I don't think we did such a bad job at the moment. Uh, Emily? M maybe I, I would just add, and, and thank you, Karen, <laughs> for that. But I would just add that these discussions, what you described, Mia, for me, actually, are and if you look at my presentation, there are discussions that really need to happen because the endocrine system is very complex. It's the communication system of the body. You can have a direct effect, but it is also going to have changes and things happening if you have some other toxicity happening. So you really need to be able to have those discussions, have the right tests, the right endpoints to be able to do this. And so it is complex and you can't just say, and now we're done, and now we're done, and now we're done. So, I, and I, I kind of agree with Karen. We are, we have been really focusing on this and hammering through on all of these substances. So, and, and the EFSA has also been doing a really great job at it. So, okay, thank you for that. Uh, the gentlemen to my right are suspiciously quiet. Would you like to <laughs> add anything to the debate? Oh, uh, apart from Dan, oh, I hasten oh. to add. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I could give you an example. I don't think delays are at the foot, the feet of the ED regulation. I worked on a herbicide dossier that went in in 2015 and still haven't seen the RAF. It's not too due to ED. It's just slow. 
and that may be particularly slow. But w would you like to defend that, Karen? So I mentioned delays. Yeah. So I mentioned the three years. It's the ideal, let's say, timing in the regulation, and we know that is very often not kept. So very often <laughs> it's taking more time. And I agree with you. It's independent of the ED issue and the ED criteria, but the ED criteria come on top now for many substances. For those who are, which were pending, for those who have been submitted after November 2018, they are in the dossier and we don't expect further delays, let's say, than the normal ones, <laughs> uh, which we hope they go down. But for those who were pending, I mean, yes, it's because this political choice to ask for data uh, also to the pending dossiers. Thank you. Um, Sander, Henrik? I think, because I think the original question was, can we actually start yes. transferring <laughs> the criteria? That's I was right. actually have to think about what the question was. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think yeah. in principle, yeah. yes, in, in a way that it's yeah. simply a definition of what we would consider an endocrine disruption and that is fit for purpose. But of course, the starting point for all the different regulations is so different. I mean, for the guidance, the ED guidance, we had more or less the luxury that we were starting with substances that were we're having a full, uh, a big data package mm. behind it, even though maybe the data package wasn't designed to answer this question, but at least we had a lot of data and we have the opportunity to, to ask for data. And that's not the same for other regulations, which is also why several regulations just refer to reach yeah. or, or biosize. If concluded EV there, like the medical devices, then we'll just adopt that conclusion because they don't have data like this. But yeah. I think the criteria itself can be transferred because basically it's a WHO definition. Then why not what? take over the conclusion? Yeah, yeah. But has anyone, um, um, if I may prompt you, uh, following on from my paracetamol show and other painkillers uh, with similar modes of action fall into this category, then there are the lipid-lowering drugs. Uh, there's experimental evidence to show that they disrupt ma male sexual um, uh, um, differentiation. Has anyone thought about uh, applying EDC criteria to the world of pharmaceuticals and medicine? Anyone? Emily. Maybe I'm uniquely qualified on the panel to answer this because I worked for the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. as a toxicologist. And you're not and an ecotoxicologist and I was at the moment. Yeah, yes. well, yeah, I'll put on the other hat right now. Yeah. But, um, but actually also on the ecotoxicology side, there are criteria and the, and the difference is actually there are also regulation eh, because FDA or, uh, or EMA, I suppose they must be in the audience, will look at the actual effect of the drug, the intended effect of the drug in question, but the environmental exposure is actually usually under the purview of, a, of another organization. So I was involved in a project together with EPA looking at environmental exposure to the SSRIs, actually also to, um, well, not paracetamol, but other painkillers which were commonly found in the water, and what can it tell us, what can the, the, the drug dossier, which is proprietary information, but we can provide some kind of information to help with that evaluation on the EPA side. So I think it is looked at. Also on the environmental side, there are, there are actually uh, criteria in place on the environmental side, also in, in the EU for the, for the environmental assessment of the, of the drugs. But, uh, but again, probably again, uh, communication between agencies and communication between regulation would improve it nevertheless. I mean, it sounds very encouraging what, what you say, but are you really sure? I'm not sure the data requirements in this area are fit for purpose to detect um, endocrine disrupting properties. I'm talking for uh, humans now, not, not eco. Yeah, I mean, I mean the drug package, the, 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 the human toxicology package that you get for, for human drugs is, is a very large data yes, package. Yes, I know. So <laughs> And, but and that in itself doesn't mean anything. No, and this is what I was just about to get to. So yeah. we did have many discussions also in the beginning of the EDSP talking with EPA about the fact that the reproduction studies which were requested were not like the extended one generation. They might not have the right endpoints. But at least I can give the encouraging inf information that this is very uh, uh, top of the line. Uh, even this 10 years ago when I was at FDA was really top of the line thinking. And there's an entire division, of course, within EPA who are all endocrinologists because they are evaluating the endocrine active drugs, which there are, of course, mm -hmm. and so they also provide information and can request specific tests when they have data which suggests that they need to. So mm -hmm. it's maybe not perfect, but it's not that it's ignored. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I think Henrik. Henrik. Yeah, and I can, I can do it short, actually, I, because I would more or less echo uh, Sander 
I, in I, principle, we, I allow we can you to go over. You can oh. say as much. Ah. As okay, then listen. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, of course, it's diff different regulations, but in principle, we, yeah. we could uh, take it. I also fully agree and understand the, the tonnage issue with REACH, for example, but I would also advocate that EDs normally exert their effects at low concentration. So maybe we should not just follow the standard tonnage level, but go a little bit below just the example of TPT <laughs> exerting effects at one to two nanograms per liter, then. 10 tons a year would also ha make massive problems. So, uh, but yes, we should take the different legislations into account and then the principle could be used. And remember to update with all the new NAMs and in, in, the, yeah. in the guidance. Yeah, thank you for that, Henrik. Is there any burning, sorry? He wanted to state. There's Rob Diederich uh, saying the OECD does develop key event-specific test guidelines already. Validation remains a cornerstone of regulatory use across countries. Thank I've you. got two thumbs up. Where's Bob? <laughs> yeah, that's quite a lot. <laughs> it's a huge number. It's, it's huge. huge. Um, any, any final comments from everyone? Anyone? Okay, it's, that's not the case. Um, I think that's the starting gun for Martin to spiral into action and soon for us to all relax and have a drink and go to the beach. So <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists for their interventions and opinions. And I think we had a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to add my thanks to all the panelists and, of course, to our star moderators who guided us um, amazingly on time through, through this. So thank you very much. You are now allowed to leave the stage. And um, again, please give them another round of applause yeah. for a great session. <laughs> And with that, um, I think I'd, I'd hand over to, to Manu now for just introducing the rapporteurs of, of our session for the final session and then, and then to close us. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Thanks, okay. Martin. So uh, briefly, just to end over to uh, our rapporteurs, namely Andrea starting, I think, and then Francesca, to uh, summarize a bit. Uh, what, what we have learned um, or what we are still wondering after this session. And uh, then I will say the few closing words, Andrea. Yeah. We are indeed a bit boxed because I will be focused on the human health and uh, Francesca on the ecotox part. And that is really because we want to cross uh, to put the, the, the two cultures together. But anyway, this doesn't matter. I think uh, there are some uh, excellent points uh, that has been taken during the discussion. And first of all, uh, uh, we were all impressed by your presentation, Andreas, with uh, an excellent communication and excellent point. Uh, I mean, a clear message from the lesson learned across the taxa. We need horizontal ED criteria, the relevance of the mister to not underestimate uh, the issue of uh, cumulative risk assessment or combined risk assessment uh, and uh, the, the relevance of, of the identification of the driver. Uh, I think you, you were very strong in uh, imposing the necessity of political decision. But for us, because of course, uh, if this is, is very useful to have this conversation for EFSA and what will be the next steps uh, and decision for EFSA, there was uh, a clear statement from you that uh, hazard cutoff criteria should be not seen as preventing doing risk assessment when this is needed. Or we can read case by case, and that's for us is, is very important uh, because that gives us the flexibility Then, if you identify a substance as, uh, as an endocrine disruptor, if fulfilled with the hazard cutoff criteria, that doesn't mean that it, in, in a defined situation we cannot produce a risk assessment uh, or, uh, or try to do a risk assessment. Then um, uh, we move to the poster pitch. Uh, the poster pitch, uh, uh, they were very much appreciated. 
uh, I can say that uh, behind the current strategy for the ED uh, identification, the one that for us is based uh, on the implementation of the criteria uh, throughout the guidance, of course, uh, there was a, a lot of overlapping what was discussed this morning. I think that temporality this fit very well. Uh, maybe we lose a bit of the pathos of this morning, but it's clear that NAM, NAM integrated in an AOP, AOP integrated in AOP networks is clear the way in which can understand what are we testing for. And that is, uh, is there is uh, indeed another uh, uh, signal behind uh, a clear message from, uh, from both Emily and also from other that's quantitative AOP is can make the future in the, it can make the difference in the future in for both protection and prediction and uh, understanding and maybe uh, for us in EFSA that uh, we are intended to invest a lot in AOP thinking that uh, uh, at least a quantitative step should be part on all uh, in all the AOP in our program because understanding this response response and the quantification can make a huge difference in the way we can use the AOP. Uh, what I really like from Albert's uh, presentation, if he was, even if he was uh, cut uh, at the best point, <laughs> where I want to see, ah, what happened to the pups, we need to wait. But that's okay, because uh, uh, in, in, a, in a close future, particularly for the thyroid, thinking hazard, no harm, thinking hazard, we, uh, uh, at least in our idea is to, to raise the relevance of the comparative thyroid assay and to have this uh, scientific data indicating that uh, the dam can be sensitive, particularly for this liver mediated uh, mode of action, but the pups and the fetus are not, uh, can make the difference the way we approach uh, the, the, the rat sensitivity for this specific mode of action. So that's for us was really uh, an important information. I don't know if it will be a, a good or bad news, in the future, but at least an information that we really like to consider. Uh, for the flash report, uh, I think for the flash report, uh, indeed there was a bit of disproportion between the ecotox and the mammalian tox, and uh, we know the position of Eric <laughs> pretty well, but again, NAMS, AOP. And, uh, and of course, when we talk about NAMS and AOP, we are talking about AOP development and NAM validation. And, and again, I, I still have the same feeling as this morning that we should, uh, uh, at this point, clarify at least the semantic for what we mean by non-validation. I think uh, we, we don't have to think as a non-validation uh, as a boring step. Uh, I think it's not boring step. I think it is the step after the enjoyable part dealing with the readiness but still remain a, a scientific important step where you produce a reprodu reproducibility. And then without a reproducibility, <coughs> you, you cannot have access to lab that can do the test. <laughs> and then uh, if you're not going to this step, it remains an academic exercise. We are still using, because Karin was very clear, uh, if you have good data, we do the systematic review, we capture this data and we use as additional information and we use. I mean, the data that we are producing for the DNT or the data produced by through TOXCAST, we, do, we use. But in terms of data requirement, uh, robustness, trust of the regulator in the data as they are by themselves, we need to start to think that reproducibility is part of the readiness criteria, is on the same streamline of scientific validation. Because without this, we, we will never get the labs doing the study, that's it. Uh, then I really appreciate the presentation from, from my friend Sander, uh, spotting the fact that uh, the guidance that we developed together can actually work. And that was also, uh, uh, thank Kari, you say, we are not doing a, a, a bad job. I think we are doing, doing a pretty good job. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that means that uh, in the framework of the criteria, I, I, we are not creating this guidance outside of this framework, in the framework of the criteria, the guidance does the job. I understand that is in a way is more is easier for the humans because for the human health, because you have more data, maybe you have a clear understanding of what is adversity, but Nina, we always come with a, a definition of adversity. And most of the time we are at least in the position to postulate a mode of action 
And I don't think that's about the 120 chemicals that you present, uh, you were able to not conclude, uh, at least not for the pesticide. Uh, and that is already, continue. Another slide. Ah, sorry. <laughs> The, so well, th that was the, uh, the the point that I want to make. So um, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, Andre. Um, yeah. So just briefly, maybe to give the impression from the environmental point of view, I would agree with Andrea that uh, the inspiring talk uh, from uh, Andrea Skortenkamp uh, really. Um, gave the, the view how the, the, the human health sector and, uh, can fertilize the environmental sector and uh, vice versa. And um, in terms of um, the achievement of this uh, session, I think uh, the objective was to identify how to um, advance in the assessment. And um, I would think we have talked a lot about NAMS in this session, much more than uh, this morning. So we have a bit compensated for the lack of uh, Ecotox talks uh, this morning on the NAMS uh, or protected NAMS, as uh, Andrik was saying. Um, but it's not only about NAMS, uh, it's, uh, it's also about the existing data, how to uh, improve uh, the three R's principle for the existing data, how to make uh, uh, full use of the data in a true weight of evidence uh, um, assessment. And uh, also we need more, more guidance, for example, for the uh, population relevance of the effects. And then uh, another point I picked up was about uh, um, the generation of new data. This also could be improved, uh, for, for example, maybe with the tiered approach where we first use some screening uh, test and then we uh, targeted the generation of information to uh, more focus um, endpoints or um, key events or um, uh, molecular initiative events that we need to make uh, the, the plausibility. Uh, then uh, looking at the debate, um, I think uh, well, we discussed uh, how to incorporate the, the NAMS in the regulatory framework for the ED assessment. There were several ideas about uh, use them for prioritization or for informing the testing strategy, uh, but also um, uh, use a NAMS together with other approaches, for example, read across and, and grouping. Um, and then, um, well, I think there was agreement that uh, um, it will not be possible to reach the same level of understanding uh, we have now for mammalian toxicology to the environment, uh, but then the discussion moved to, to actually uh, agree that we don't need to, to have the same level of understanding and that um, we could regulate substances um, uh, with a definite amount of information and we don't need to, to know everything and to, be, to have a perfect knowledge to, to, to move to the next step and regulate a substance when, um, when we can. And, um, and also we can uh, extrapolate, again, to come back to this idea of integration of uh, the human health and the environmental uh, assessment. And um, I think this also would uh, uh, help uh, speeding up the implementation of uh, science into regulation. And I think I stop here in the interest of time. Thank you. I think I'll be very, very brief, but um, let's start from the, um, the, the due considerations that I have to, to make, but I'm happy to make. Thank you, Martin, for chairing uh, today. Thank you very much, and also for the preparation before. <laughs> and thank you to the panelists, to Andreas and uh, Sharon. Um, and uh, um, I want also want to um, thank the colleagues that the behind the scenes, which did a, a huge amount of work. <laughs> Francesca, Andrea, Mima today, uh, Elena, uh, Aude remotely, and uh, Maria, the session coordinator. Uh, for, for a long time, she had to, to interact with you. What I want to take home from this, uh, besides the discussion, I hope new contacts, new uh, people entering in, in, in the loop of our work, uh, and we could exchange 
experienced young colleagues, uh, uh, experimental people. This is what makes our work uh, more interesting every day. So not only regula regulatory, but also new, new, uh, new people in the net. So I hope we can uh, keep in touch and remain in touch. And uh, having said this, two things to remind you with, that tomorrow the session will start 8.30. Uh, yeah, very hard, uh, uh, Friday for a Friday. Uh, 8.30, we will check everybody mm, uh, if you are there. And also, mm, uh, for those who are uh, following remotely, uh, we have the nice chance to meet virtually three of our participants of today who kindly agreed to be available. So uh, feel free to, to uh, remain connected and interact. Having said this, for those who are living uh, physically or uh, uh, virtually, I thank you very much and I wish you a nice uh, hot evening, probably, uh, uh, in Brussels. Thank you very much.